Chair Koenig, I have the Zoom meeting open. Good morning, everyone. I'll now call to order the regular meeting of the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. Clerk, if we could have a roll call, please. Uh, Ex officio, Scott Eats. Present. Commissioner Peterson. Present. Commissioner Sandy Brown. Here. Commissioner Johnson. Here. Commissioner Montesino. Here. Commissioner Hernandez. Here. Commission Alternate Schifrin. Here. Commission Alternate Quinn. Here. Commissioner Koenig. Here. Commissioner McPherson. Here. Commissioner Kristen Brown. Here. And Commissioner Rodkin. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. And for the record, it is Thursday, April 6, 2023, 9.01 a.m. I think everyone is here present, so I'm assuming we do not have any AB 2449 requests. So are there any additions or deletions to the consent or regular agendas today? Uh, yes, there are. Um, there um, is a handout for item 11 and a replacement page for item 25, and those are both posted to our website. And also there will not be a closed session today, so we'll be pulling items um, 26 through 27. Okay, thank you. We're not going to move on to resolution of appreciation for storm damage response. Do we have a presentation on this? I know there was uh, maybe some photos. Good morning, commissioners. Rachel Marconi of your staff. Before you today is a um, recommendation to approve a resolution of appreciation for all of the outstanding work that the crews from Caltrans, the cities of Capitola, Santa Cruz, Scotts Valley, and Watsonville and Santa Cruz Metro have done over the last few months through the extraordinary um, flooding, snow, hail, you name it, our, a lot of trees falling, power lines down. And um, we have several of the crew here today and um, we'll go through a little sideshow of pictures as you read the resolution. I'll hand it over to you, Chair. Okay, uh, well, I will begin by reading the resolution, which is whereas, or I should say resolution of appreciation for California Department of Transportation, Caltrans, County of Santa Cruz, City of Watsonville, City of Capitola, City of Santa Cruz, and City of Scotts Valley, Public Works and Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District, Metro staff, Whereas beginning at the end of December 2022 through March 2023, California was struck by several severe storms that brought heavy rainfall, damaging winds, flooding widespread power outages, snowfall in areas unaccustomed to snow and evacuations for hundreds of residents. Whereas the storms caused the closure of local roads and state highways throughout Santa Cruz County. Whereas employees. California Department of Transportation, County of Santa Cruz, and cities of Capitola, Santa Cruz, Scotts Valley, and Wattsville worked tirelessly to clear debris and restore access to critical transportation facilities throughout the region. Whereas Caltrans and local public works departments worked 24 hours a day emergency repairs, clear trees and other debris, remove snow and open roadways for the public. Whereas the Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit Tr District assisted with evacuation of residents most vulnerable to flooding. Whereas maintenance crews have performed their duties in emergency conditions throughout the winter in order to ensure the continued operations of the transportation system. And whereas access to roadways has been and continues to be crucial to the safety of emergency responders and residents throughout communities impacted by the storms from December until now. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission extends to the California Department of Transportation, County of Santa Cruz, City of Capitola, City of Santa Cruz, City of Scotts Valley, City of Watsonville, and Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District employees, its commendation and appreciation for their continued work serving the people of Santa Cruz County, ensuring the safety of the traveling public throughout the 2022-2023 storm season. I think we're all seeing some of the pictures of the extreme impacts to our transportation infrastructure that we saw over the last few months. I think it's important to recognize that our road infrastructure is probably the one piece of public infrastructure that every person uses just about every day. And to, to highlight some of the just extreme measures that our public works, Caltrans and Metro uh, went through in order to keep the system operational. The County of Santa Cruz had 2,500 service requests through its road dispatch 911 calls. 
approximately 300 road closures, over 18,000 regular hours and 5,000 overtime hours worked by county crews for storm response or cleanup. Almost 1,000 cubic yards of slide and tree debris cleared off of roads, approximately 45,000 sandbags and 900 tons of sand delivered to the community and 4,060 potholes patched. We do have resolutions of appreciation for all of the- I'd like to invite all of the crews that and staff that helped um, with the storm recovery. We have several of them in the audience. And if you guys don't mind coming up in front of the dais there, um, we'd love to do a photo of all of you guys as well, if you wouldn't mind. Come on up. Just come up here and paste the other yeah. picture this way. Good job, everybody. All right. Some of the names of folks that we have with us today are Eric DeGroote. If you guys want to like raise your hand and tell me I pronounced your name wrong, that's also fine. Eric was a superstar out there sending text messages in the middle of the night to let everyone know what was going on. Jake Bradbury. Awesome. Thanks, Jake. Um, Ian Wynn. Ian works in the structures and construction engineering department and Jorge Uberwaga. Did I screw it up? <laughs> um, Oh, I think I saw you at the bridge. Were you down at uh, San Lorenzo River one day looking at all the pile up of the logs? I remember that. Okay, sorry. Uh, Zeke Delamas, thanks for all your emails. Also, Zeke um, has been a superstar with the public information team for Caltrans. Anyone else from Caltrans make it today? All right, thanks Caltrans team for representing. Alex Sandoval from the county. Are you, thanks, Alex, for coming and organizing everyone and getting them out there. Boy, the county really thanks Commissioner Manu um, Koenig for highlighting some of the massive work that you guys have and are still working on. I, for a couple of years here, I think we're still working on the 1997 storm still. No, <laughs> maybe not. Um, from Metro, we have Michael Tree representing his team. Thank you, Michael, for getting folks out there, even filling sandbags, doing... Getting, I have paratransit friends that, you know, we're shuttling people out, you know, working 18 hour days. So your crew really stepped up. That was great. And Commissioner Montesino is out there doing it too. All right. And they're uh, from Capitola, Jesse and Steve. Thanks you guys for coming. And yeah, we were sharing stories earlier about the power lines. Um, boy, a lot of crazy work there. And I don't think I named everyone. Who did I miss? There's a lot of you up there, but I hope um, you'll come up and get your recognition. But thank you guys for all of your work. That was fantastic. Do you have a certificate for each agency? <laughs> City of Santa Cruz. I'm here for Claire. Can't be here today. Let's get in. Credit. <laughs> you approved emergency funding, I'm sure. <laughs> and if any of you guys want to come up and say a few things, come on back here and you can share some stories about how awesome your crew was. That'd be great. No pressure. <laughs> I'll share one if I could. Okay, so Scott Eads with Caltrans, and uh, I just wanted to highlight one. I've got many. Um, I was not here as these gentlemen were, but um, 
I, I talked to my PIO um, person recently and he said that Eric DeGroote, um, standing over there in the black shirt, um, started his day at about 1230 in the morning when, uh, when the snow started falling. And so he went up to close the road, ended up helping some motorists that had become stranded, then spent time dealing with fallen trees, down power lines, opening and closing roadways, trying to get the right equipment in the right places and ended his day somewhere in the evening of the next day. So very, very long. That's just one day in the life of Eric in recent times. And Zeke um, and Jake and um, Jorge and Ian, Ian um, all were at the scene throughout many of these events, um, the whole Pajaro thing, um, and the just the, the in in the moment challenges of whether we were going to cut a hole through our highway or not um, to drain that massive lake that was backed up against Highway One, just a lot of really challenging stuff. And these guys are rock stars, so appreciate them. Any other member of the public want to speak? Not. Is there anyone online? Uh, we have Mr. Harry Pico. I think he's probably here for the general public comment, but um, anyone on the commission wish to say any remarks? Take a comment quickly. Go ahead. Uh, I just want to, again, extend such gratitude for all of the public works crews, for Metro, for everyone that did so much work during these um, unprecedented storms. I think we're all kind of done living through so many historical events, but this was yet another one uh, in terms of these storms. Um, I am, of course, here on RTC in the capacity with Metro, and I'd like to um, acknowledge Michael Tree is here today. Uh, Metro created an emergency schedule for Route 79 to serve the fairgrounds uh, multiple times with uh, the, the flooding, um, and um, Metro paratransit van and bus drivers transported residents out of evacuation zones. Uh, so much work. Uh, being done through Metro. And again, while I'm here um, in my in my capacity as a representative to Metro, I would be remiss if I didn't also acknowledge um, as the vice mayor of the city of Capitola that we have Jesse Frankie and Steve Needens um, from city of Capitola here today, or, or City Steve as he's affectionately referred to uh, on the streets, um, but also just all of our staff in the city of Capitola, everyone at the county, just unbelievable work. Um, in, in Capitola specifically, crews had the Esplanade back open to the public within 36 hours of the January 5th storm. And it, it's just, um, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful as I know all of our community is for the work that all of you have done uh, to ensure that people are safe and able to get to where they need to be and are sheltered and cared for. And so again, just so much gratitude. Um, I'm not sure that there's enough words for me to say today to really express how important the work that you have done has been to our community. Yeah, I'd just like to add, add um, a special thank you as the uh, fifth district supervisor representing the San Lorenzo Valley that literally got slammed with about 80% of the, the danger or the, the problems that we had. Uh, Caltrans was up there front and center, uh, our county road crews as well. Um, it's really, uh, the, and I had a town hall meeting last night with uh, Congressman Panetta and uh, we were discussing that. Probably the transportation issue was the biggest thing that came up. Um, power outages as well, of course, too. But um, we're going to get there. Highway 9, it takes time. Uh, we wish we could get it there uh, more quickly. But, um, you know, the rains keep coming. And I guess we're going to have a little more tomorrow. But uh, I think they're moving uh, ahead. Uh, what they have done 24-7 is just phenomenal. Uh, Caltrans, since my becoming a county supervisor 10 years ago, they have been front and center working on just a, a variety of issues like the wildlife crossing on Highway 17 or the uh, the extension of Highway 9 to, to widen it so we can have more pedestrian access between the town of Felton and the schools. Um, it's just been really impressive what Caltrans has done and the cooperative work they've done. It takes a lot of time and uh, it'll be some years in the making for some of these things, but uh, they've been there and our county road crew have been really answering front and center too. So I really appreciate what they have done. Thank you, Commissioner McPherson. Commissioner Brown. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just, I, I wanted to say thank you to all of the agencies, the commissioner, 
um, all of the agencies that stepped up and in an incredible, incredibly challenging and, um, and, and just put crews out there, got to work, and to the people who went out and did that work 24-7, uh, literally, uh, with very little rest, um, people just stepped up. And uh, so I want to thank you for that. You all, your work uh, made it possible for a whole lot of people in our community to um, continue to move about their days uh, with as little disruption as possible. And and so I just want to thank you from really the bottom of my heart for all of that work. And then just uh, recognize the role, uh, the work of the city of Santa Cruz. Uh, our staff could not be here today for a variety of reasons, work-related and uh, a sick baby. <laughs> so I got to receive the resolution and I want to thank uh, the commission on behalf of the city. Thank you. I'll move the resolution. Second. All right, we have a motion from Commissioner Schiffer and a, commissioner, a second from Commissioner Rodkin. Um, before we vote on that, I do still see a member of the public with their hand up. And um, if there is anyone that wants to comment on the resolution, we'll take that comment now. Go ahead, Mr. Pico. Um, actually, very quickly, but I do want to speak on the other topic. I do want to mention that I had volunteered my home as a refuge or, you know, temporary shelter and uh, through Zach Friend, and he was unable to find a way to get that to work. So in the future, uh, there would be, it would be nice to have a, a place where people can offer temporary housing for people. Uh, that's it. Thank you. All right. Thank you for that suggestion. All right. We have a motion on the floor to uh, adopt the resolution. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, roll call, please. Yeah, to, uh, I believe we have, do we have to do a roll call because it's a hybrid meeting? All right. No, all, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, that motion passes unanimously. Thank you again to all of our uh, staff who've done the hard work out there on the roads. Yeah. Could I say one uh, word about it? Because I think in all thanking all the agencies, I'm not sure we thanked our RTC staff. Um, and yet it sounded like they were out there doing uh, a great deal of work as well. So um, I, do you give a resolution? You don't, don't generally give a resolution to yourself, but <laughs> I think it is appropriate to thank them for all the work that they did as part of that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. All right, we'll now proceed to item five, oral communications. A member of the public may address the commission on any item within the jurisdiction of the commission that is not already on the agenda. The commission will listen to the all communication but in compliance with state law. It may not take action on items that are not on the agenda. Speakers are requested to state their name clearly so that it can be accurately recorded in the minutes of the meeting. We'll start here in chambers. Yes, if you, if you have a comment, uh, comment, please approach the podium. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, Jim Helmer, Ben Loman, and I want to thank you. Uh, thank Supervisor McPherson and Congressman Panetta for last night's town hall. I just wish the 50 to 75 people that were there and maybe the 200 that were at the prior town hall could have uh, recognized the work of all these all these folks and the RTC. Um, last year, I um, commended the RTC and the county for getting the Glen Arbor Bridge into the long range transportation plan for replacement. This is a narrow 20 foot wide bridge uh, that goes over Newell Creek. It, uh, two officials have told me they've seen that it's sinking. It's 20 feet wide and it's been the de facto Highway 9 bridge for almost three months. And it will continue to be the Highway 9 bridge as we go through the long rebuilding process. So the project is P102 in the long range transportation plan. It shows zero funding between now and 2045. Uh, it's estimated at $4 million. I encourage the RTC, uh, Caltrans, the federal government to look at um, alternative innovative ways to fund the replacement of that bridge. It's called for to become 12 foot standard lanes with eight foot standard shoulders, a full 40 feet. Um, 
Also, you have a project with Mark Thomas and Associates right now on the Highway 9 corridor from downtown Felton to South Glen Arbor Road Bridge. That is doing the engineering, preliminary engineering work for student, uh, for pedestrians, bicyclists, bicyclists and, and campus circulation. I encourage you to look at an amendment to that contract to look at the section from the high school north to the south, northerly to the South Glen Arbor Bridge. That section of road has been closed multiple times due to mudslides, landslides, power down, utilities down in the last three months. We should amend that uh, complete streets plan to one that includes retaining walls, drainage systems for the benefit of safer travel for the pedestrians, bicyclists, and motorists. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to give uh, Mr. Helmer a, a compliment. He's a former uh, city traffic in, uh, engineer for the city of Santa Cruz, and he, he's a model of citizen involvement. I get regular emails from him about issues in the in the uh, San Lorenzo Valley and the things that are going up there. And he, he's on these issues, and he's not just complaining about things. He often has very uh, useful and productive suggestions for ways things can be fixed, and appreciate that kind of citizen involvement. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Rockin. Anyone else here in chambers that wishes to speak? All right, seeing none, is there anyone online? Mr. Kerry Pico. Uh, I hope you have my slide projector going. Give me one second here. And I wish I had more than two minutes. So we, I, we see it now, go ahead. Yeah, okay, so I will start. I'm not going to read it all because I have only two minutes, so uh, look on the left, this is about the trail stuff. There's a cross section. It shows you that this is from the segment nine. There's the retaining walls up to, on both sides, left and right, goes up to 17 feet. The right picture is a, is a side view of, if you were walking down the path, those would be the walls on uh, in different heights throughout. So um, next slide, please. So uh, in short, I just want you to know that the, all those retaining walls for a one and a half mile section, there's about uh, three, uh, 2.7 miles of retaining walls. And that requires a lot of concrete, which means a lot of cement, which if you don't know, is a huge uh, uh, source of greenhouse gases. And um, it's equivalent to about 5 million combustion car miles, but more importantly, it's equivalent to about 20 electric, uh, 20 million electric car miles. And in 2035, if any train were ever to come on, uh, they, that would grossly outweigh any benefit that a train would have. So in short, a trail designed causing, uh, is causing more environmental damage than it's supposed to do. Uh, next slide. But while you're switching the sides, I do want to say that it, with the it will none of these these trails will grossly outweigh with co2 with all the cement than any benefit of a train in the future um the next slide is i just want to show you the cost which is about 13 million to 30 million per mile and i want to compare that with the smart train trail which is a 2.7 million per mile because it's on flatland without all these retaining walls uh freeway project our highway one is 40 million a mile and my point is, when a trail costs the same or more than a freeway lane, something's wrong. So here you are trying to build a, an environmental project by saving the tracks where they are, and you're actually creating a higher impact on greenhouse gases than you're actually saving. And I don't mean just for one year, I'm talking about over 30 years. So something's not quite right. I recommend, and I know that you're not gonna do this, but I really wish you would, is take that money, build a low risk, uh, interim trail, I'm not talking about the Greenway Trail or anything, but like a, an easy, cheap trail that people can use that's sufficient, which is what they use like in Monterey and stuff like that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Pico. Okay. We have Johanna Lighthill. Good morning, commissioners. Thank you for taking my comments. Um, today I'm requesting that the commission 
establish a minimum standard level of service or LOS for the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail. Um, like many in our community, I've been following the development of the trail and I've found that there are several publications to aid trail designers. I've found that most trail designers first ask themselves, what type of trail will serve our community or how wide should we make our trail? Well, our trail planners haven't had that luxury and instead of asking how wide should our trail be, they ask how wide can our trail be? Because of the challenges of our constrained corridor, they're limited and are doing what, what they can with what they have. Um, until recently, the trail has been mostly conceptual. Now that the designs are becoming a reality, I asked the commission to consider whether the ultimate trail will provide the service the community is expecting. On segment nine, the trail's width mostly meets the absolute minimum required by Caltrans. And um, on near El Dorado, it's less than the minimum. One guide explains that a path of this width should only be used in rare instances where bicycle use is expected to be low and pedestrian use not more than occasional. As with vehicle traffic on roads, a shared use path level of service can be calculated based on the number of anticipated users determined by the UCS and using the trail width designated by Caltrans standards. This trail scores an F. Uh, trail conflicts pose dangers and will discourage use by the most vulnerable users, the elderly and children. The general plans of the county and Watsonville have minimum required um, level of services of D for vehicular traffic. Since the goal is to increase the use by bikes and pedestrians, I asked the commission to establish a minimum level of service on the trail to assure trails designed moving forward meet the needs of the community and goals and objectives established in the master plan. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Lighthill. Mr. Barry Scott. Uh, thank you, uh, commissioners. I am uh, I'm, I'm calling in today with nothing but praise and gratitude. First of all, I'm, I'm very delighted with the, the City Council, Santa Cruz City Council vote recently to approve the ultimate trail unanimously. That's remarkable. I am grateful to RTC commissioners and staff for several things. First, briefly, the goats are, are, have been in my neighborhood on Rio Del Mar Boulevard. It was delightful to see them a couple of days ago. Thank you very much. Uh, as I look at the news and updates page on your uh, on, our, on the RTC website, I'm reminded at, uh, how much you're working, the RTC uh, is working with other organizations, AMBAG and TAMC and Coast Rail Coordinating Council and Metro. And I thank you for that. It's really a regional effort to get trails and transit and streets and roads working well. Thank you for that. Um, I want to I want to congratulate staff for their remarkable skills in grant writing. And I look at your page, I see seventy two point one six million for state and highway auxiliary lane bus on shoulder. Another thirty million in federal grant funding for multimodal projects. One hundred and fifteen million for the coastal rail trail. These are record setting grant amounts, and you guys must be doing something right. I think no small part of it is that so many of them are multimodal. And so the rail with trail ultimate plan, I think is easier to fund than uh, as, as expensive as it may be, is easier to fund than one or the other alone. I uh, finally want to thank, thank you for uh, doing so much public outreach, presentations to the Capitola City Council, the Sea Cliff Association, and the Rio Del Mar Improvement Association coming up on April 19th. Thank you, uh, Sarah, for coming to speak with uh, Marcus Pimentel, Kent Edler, and Kieran Kelly to update the community on what's going on. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Equity, equity Transit. Hi, good morning, and thank you, commissioners and staff, for your ongoing work on bringing zero emission passenger rail to our community and recent presentations that include replacement bridges spanning a number of important sections as a part of segment 12. 
I was reviewing the letter written by the California Coastal Commission sent to the executive director, Guy Preston, in 2021. And here's a summarized quote from that letter. On behalf of the California the Coastal Commission staff, Thank you for the opportunity to provide comments on the TCAA Rail Network Integration Study. Because of the wide range of equitable access that can be provided to users of all ages and abilities through the combination of rail transit, bike, and pedestrian uses, the California Coastal Commission staff supports the recommended locally preferred alternative of electric passenger rail. By connecting Santa Cruz with Watsonville and Pajaro, this locally preferred rail transit alternative can be expected to meet the needs of the diverse communities through which it passes. By being one of the key facilities for providing rail service throughout the Monterey Bay, connecting to the greater San Francisco Bay Area, the plans for passenger rail in Santa Cruz align with the vision of the 2018 state rail plan connecting cities by rail across the state of California. This letter from the Coastal Commission shows clear support for passenger rail on our branch line. In order to further this important project and position us to be competitive for federal and state grants, we urge the RTC staff and commissioners to consider a more robust 30% engineering plan instead of the current 15%. And we urge the RTC to include 15 minute headways in their studies as the most important driver of ridership is frequency and high ridership equates to VMT reduction in our key measurements for California and federal grants including the Fast Start grants, the CAPD, um, which aligns with the CAPD, and measurements and determinations for most California grants available for our project. Thank you so much for your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Faulkner. Mr. Brian Peoples. Sorry, Brian, can you unmute can again? You hear, yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me now? Okay, thank you. This is Brian Peoples from Trail Now. Um, I provided a picture of the historic Capitola Trestle landmark. Um, in 2018, Measure L, the Capitola community voted yes for Measure L, which is the trail on the trestle, uh, not through the village. So the community, Capitola community wants the trail on the Capitola trestle. At the March 23rd city council meeting, executive director Guy Preston uh, gave an explanation of what it will take to open the coast, the Capitola trestle as a trail. And he basically said the interim trail is the plan that needs to be implemented. He actually provided detailed assessment of that years ago and explain the federal rail banking process that needed to take place in order to use this valuable asset for our community. Building the trail on the existing trestle is the quickest way to open the corridor for transportation. That trestle is not capable of a passenger train nor a freight train. It's actually five separate trestles. Neither Similar trail projects uh, that uh, use the corridor, um, Progressive Rail has no rights to prevent the use of it, nor does Roaring Camp have rights to prevent the use of it. We're asking the community to, to move forward and um, listen to Mr. Preston's desire or recommendation to open the the corridor, open the trestle as an active transportation corridor. Please support the opening of the Capitola trestle as a interim trail today. We need that open today and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peebles. All right, seeing no one else online or in chambers that wishes to address some public comment. Then we'll proceed with action on the consent agenda. This is items six through 19. Does any member of the commission wish to pull an item from the consent agenda? Yeah, uh, would it please the commission to pull number 13, which is the status on measure D revenues? Just a quick question. I would point out, um, I you know, certainly could pull item 13, but that we do have a review of the 20. 
324 budget later on in the meeting. So, okay, we still would like to, uh, all right. Then uh, we'll pull item 13 and hear that uh, before moving on with item 20. Any other member of the commission wish to pull an item or comment on any item? Does any member of the public wish to comment on any items on consent? Seeing no one here in chambers, anyone online? Move the consent agenda. That's, That's amended. amended. Second. second. All right. So we have a motion from Commissioner Schifrin, a second from Commissioner Rotkin to adopt the consent agenda, uh, accepting item 13. Any further comment? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? That passes unanimously. All right, we'll proceed with item 13 then. And Commissioner Johnson, is there? Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> so I'd, I have just, I didn't bring my laptop, but I believe it's on page 69, the, the neighborhood um, grant towards each jurisdiction. I think it lists the different from the county to the different cities in terms of what they receive percentages. Oh yeah, thanks. Right there. So, um, you know, I have the deepest respect for Capitola. We're like sister cities, we're small. Um, but Scotts Valley happens to have probably 25% more population. Um, happens to have twice the uh, the amount of square miles for its city and also more road miles. But if you look at this on column one, the rate, uh, we receive less in terms of dollars than Capitola. Now in 2016, I think it was baked into some sort of agreement, but traditionally, uh, the formula used for um, uh, processing and granting funds for jurisdictions is based on population and not so much road miles. And so, you know, I, get, I understand the kind of some of the historical reasons why that happened, but I'm just wondering if, if this is fair and equitable to a city that has more population, more road miles and more square miles. And so I don't know if there is a remedy, but, or if it's, um, I'm open to, to understand why this is defensible, but from the perspective of our city, we should be receiving based on just basic formula and maybe fairness, uh, a fair share. So uh, maybe the executive director can explain why, given those factors, we receive less in terms of dollars. Uh, so you're correct that most um, uh, transportation sales tax measures do um, um, create by formula the distribution, and it's usually done by population and road miles. My understanding is that this measure that was passed in 2016, and that was prior to, to me taking this position, also included point of sale um, in the uh, equation. Uh, that was written in the ordinance and voted on by the public. So unfortunately, that could not be changed without another vote by the public. And I'll hand it over to um, uh, Deputy Director Mendez, who was here in 2016, who may have additional information on exactly how the formula works. Uh, as Mr. Preston is correct, yes, it, uh, the formula has three variables that, that were uh, approved uh, uh, in the measure as well that, uh, that the voters uh, uh, approved with over two thirds uh, vote, and so it doesn't. It doesn't include population, doesn't include road miles, but it also includes a, a factor for the area where the tax uh, is raised. So then that means er areas where you know the, there are more more sales that raise that that um, uh, the revenue for that uh, uh, transactions and use tax would also um, uh, benefit from from the fact that they you know have those sales in, in their area so that's so is that a status thing or is it revisited every year where the point of sales are updated uh, the um well the formula um um it's the same formula that gets used uh, every, i understand the formula every year but, is but it, what happens is, is it every, uh, every year me, is it updated each and every year uh, to, to reflect the fact that these are the points of sales. This is where it's coming from, and so forth. It, it is new data every year, but it's the same formula. So, so we we will update the the population numbers uh, each year. We will update the um, uh, 
uh, road mile numbers and also update the uh, information on you know where the, the uh, tax sales uh, were done. And we get that information from the state uh, Department of Tax and Fee Administration through their reports. We use their reports to determine that. All right, thank you. Any other questions from commissioners? Carmen. Move the recommendation. One, one moment, please. Uh, Commissioner Rodkin. I just want to point out um, many now decades, not just years ago, the city of Santa Cruz forego the opportunity to develop 41st Avenue into the Capitola Mall, and it got taken over by the city of Capitola. And maybe to avoid a little fight between Capitola and Scotts Valley over this issue, the numbers between those two cities jump out at you. But the reality is that the city of Santa Cruz also suffers relatively in this because we didn't take that great sales tax generator. Um, I'm not sure it was a good idea because you were required to pave all the streets in between 41st Avenue and the city of Santa Cruz, whatever. But it's just the reality of that uh, mall being created and the fact that it's a huge tax generator compared to what goes on in the other cities. And so that's just kind of the fact, the historical fact of why that imbalance, and Randy's right, it's an imbalance goes on in terms of what's going on here. They took a big sales tax generator and the other cities don't have it. No, I, I appreciate that. And like I say, it's, um, I, I love Capitola. I met my wife there, okay? So <laughs> the Edgewater, okay, so. Um, but um, so it's nothing against Capitola. We're not taking it personal. <laughs> so, um, but thank you for the explanation. All right, thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Does any member of the public wish to comment on this item? Seeing no one here in chambers, is there anyone on Zoom? No? All right, is there a motion? So moved. Second. Motion by Commissioner Schifrin, second by Commissioner Montesino to accept the Measure D revenue uh, report. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, uh, or all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? That motion passes unanimously. All right, we'll now proceed with item 20, which is commissioner reports. Any member of the to make a report? Yes, Commissioner. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. A couple things. Um, I'd like to report, I'm sorry that Michael Tree, the CEO of Metro, uh, had to leave, but uh, there was, uh, and many of us uh, attended a share ride event at the Monterey Bay Marine Sanctuary headquarters at the foot of Santa Cruz Wharf. Um, and it was um, what uh, Metro has been a great partner with us uh, and for the people of Santa Cruz County. And it is sharing uh, some of the revenue or the potential for that to go to the sanctuary. Uh, and it's really a, a great program. And you've seen uh, we're giving or the Metro is, is uh, giving some uh, the, that money to the sanctuary as well as share a ride. Franz Lanting and his wife, uh, just uh, tremendous. The, the book that they have on the sanctuary and the marine life around here. Uh, it, it's just a great statement for Metro to make and get out in front of something to protect our environment. It's uh, very much appreciated and Metro is to be commended because they've been great partners through and through. And uh, I know some of us, uh, others of, of us uh, attended that event. Uh, secondly, I'd, I'd like to mention, and I, as I have in a couple of other uh, forums, that uh, a couple of weeks ago, I went to San Luis Obispo uh, to, uh, uh, to testify before the Board of Supervisors there for the expansion of the Community Choice Central Coast Community Energy, formerly Monterey Bay Community Power. Uh, we did, we tried to get the unincorporated area of San Luis Obispo uh, to join us. Uh, they did not do that pre-COVID, but uh, just a couple of weeks ago they voted and uh, they've accepted to join us. Now we have 35 agencies from Santa Cruz County to Santa Barbara. And the reason this is important is that community choice energy is the electrification of power. It, we're, uh, it has grants for electrifying buses and, and put into some charging stations and all throughout this 
uh, probably now more than 8,000 square miles, the biggest uh, community choice aggregation agency in the state and maybe the nation. I just like to thank all the people who worked on that and did it. Uh, this is a tremendous thing. Uh, we are on track now to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions that are set by the state that they set for 2045 by 2030. So uh, it's uh, it's a real credit to everybody who's worked on, on this to expand this agency and uh, community choice energy uh, Central uh, Coast Community Choice Energy has done a fantastic job, and uh, we, we've got 35 agencies that are working together and uh, on the same bus. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner McPherson. Commissioner Rockin. On that same topic, people may wonder, you know, how much does it matter to us that San Luis Obispo County joins with PCE? Um, these storms that we just talked about a little earlier this morning are not just a uh, random or an accident or something and they're directly related the the, the uh, extent of them and the the uh, power of them and the destruction they they wreak are directly related to generation of greenhouse gases and um, having our neighbors in San Luis Obispo County reduce their greenhouse gas emission makes a difference to us we live on one planet and it's not just what we do here locally in our city or our county but the fact that we get uh, involved in things that have other communities join us in this effort really does make a difference. So I really do want to commend 3CE for finally getting all five counties into the that are in this Central Coast region as part of this effort. It, it makes a difference to us directly. Thank you, Commissioner Rockin. Any other commissioners wish to make a report? Just yeah, Commissioner Kristen Brown. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to remind folks about uh, Metro's Youth Cruise Free program that's allowing uh, free fares for K through 12 students uh, on Metro uh, 24 of the Metro routes. Um, students in uh, eighth grade and under might be asked to show their grade level uh, or school ID. Writers in grades nine through 12 will be asked to to show their student ID. Um, those without one can get a uh, youth cruise free ID at one of the metro uh, centers, either at the Watsonville Transit Center, the Pacific Station in downtown Santa Cruz, but it's a really great opportunity for students in K through 12 uh, to utilize our transit system uh, free of cost. So I just wanted to continue to share that uh, with the public. Thank you, Commissioner Brown. I'll just add one more report in, on the theme of regional collaboration. On March 15th, Executive Director Preston and I traveled to Sacramento for the Central Coast Coalition Day. This was with uh, other uh, county partners in the, and cities in the Central Coast Coalition, which include Monterey County, Santa Barbara County, San Benito County, San Luis Obispo County, and of course, Santa Cruz. And we were advocating for, uh, generally speaking, projects, uh, transportation projects that will benefit the entire Central Coast region. And in particular, advocating for increased funding of the TERSIP, it's the Transit and Inner City Rail Capital Program, which, um, as, as the name suggests, funds transit um, in the coming state budget, as well as more funding for active transportation. We saw some historic highs with the uh, budget situation at the state last year, and uh, we were explaining that we need to see that level of funding continue if we're going to continue to make progress on this important issue of uh, improving transit and uh, active transportation usage. I think also, uh, we did have an opportunity to uh, talk to folks from uh, CalSTA who are reviewing the TERSIP applications. I think it's of note that this year, the Santa Cruz Metro submitted a TERSIP application that would help pay for 24 new hydrogen buses, a hydrogen fueling station, and funding for the Watsonville Transit Center redevelopment project that would include 60 units of low-income housing. And of course, we also have a uh, TERSIP uh, application on the planning side of things through the Regional Transportation Commission here uh, for our passenger rail EIR and the EIR for the remaining segments of the trail. So I believe we'll hear back uh, about those in the next uh, month or two, and it should be indicative of uh, how things are going. It's also worth noting that Monterey County applied for a TERSIP grant for Pajaro Station, which in many ways would be the is, is the beginning of the Santa Cruz branch line. Um, and we'll hopefully, our fingers crossed, they do well with that as well. Um, it's also interesting to hear that Monterey County has been experiencing challenges with the Coastal Commission uh, for their surf line, their surf bus line, which uh, they've been is proposed for uh, between where they have their coastal trail and the railroad tracks. So just um, something to keep in mind. 
And that's uh, entirely of my report. Thanks for your participation. Sure. If there's no other commissioner reports, will uh, any public comment on commissioner reports? Seeing none here in chambers, none online. Just, I just had somebody raise their hand, Mr. Brian Peoples. Go ahead, Mr. Peoples. Hi, this is Brian Peoples from Trail Now. Um, so when the Santa Cruz City approved the U ultimate trail on segment nine, um, they did not, the, the city staff incorrectly communicated to the city council that they could not do uh, the interim trail and that the funding from this grant from the CTC would not allow that. So we contacted the CTC and now we have a, re a communication network with the, the funding group that's funding active transportation. When I spoke to them, they were actually fairly surprised of the pushback and the the, the big uh, issue and the decisions being made by the city and that the city staff incorrectly communicated to city council the true process of allowing uh, the interim trail to be funded with the grant. And so the, uh, I want to remind us all that we want to make sure that the California Transportation Commission um, is uh, in in parallel effort in agreement with what the community wants. And it was actually interesting because the director of active transportation um, was a little, um, little shaken up because she's not used to this kind of pushback. We're having people call her and sending her emails and now we've got that connection. So we're really really want to make sure that this community gets the funding and we don't create a lot of swirl with our California Transportation Commission. So we're hopeful that we continue to move forward with building the interim trail and um, not doing uh, damage to our community, as uh, Carrie Pinko pointed out, in the, the 400 trees that are being cut for the segment. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Peoples. Are there any other comments online? We do not have any other comments. All right, then we'll proceed with item 21, the executive director report. Thank you, Chair Koenig, and I appreciate um, your update on our legislative trip. That was a, a good and fruitful trip. And I have uh, met with Assembly um, member Don Addis recently and um, I gave her the scoop on all the work that's gonna be happening in uh, Assembly District 30. Um, um, that's a new, uh, newly drawn di district and has most of the work that um, we're going to be commencing in the next few years in it. And she was very happy to hear um, how much work will be coming to her district. Um, I do have an update on RTC's storm damage repair contracts. On Thursday, March 9th, um, I consulted with Chair Koenig, and we agreed that emergency contract was needed to repair two partial washouts of the railroad embankment at milepost um, 8.49. Uh, that's about 800 feet east of San Andreas Road Rail Bridge near Manresa State Beach and at milepost 14.65 in um, New Brighton State Beach area north of the campground. Uh, failure to address these two sites expeditiously could have resulted in additional damage due to a failed culvert and due to drainage channels being blocked by debris. RTC staff has re had received two bids for the work and as consulted and agreed upon um, with Chair Koenig, I subsequently executed a contract with the low bidder industrial railroad uh, company for a lump sum amount of $328,522. Um, also on Thursday, March 9th, I consulted with Chair Koenig and we agreed that another emergency contract was needed to remove storm damage debris at 23 locations from Harkin Slough in Watsonville to the western end of Prospect Avenue in Capitola. The debris uh, needed to be removed from the branch line to restore proper function of the rail line and its stormwater drainage system. RTC staff had received two bids for the work and as agreed upon with Chair Koenig, I subsequently executed a contract with the low bidder, again, Industrial Railroads Company for a lump sum amount of $194,868. Under both contracts, slopes will be stabilized with erosion control treatments to prevent future damage. 
Due to the emergency declaration, both FEMA and Cal OES funds are available to fund this work. However, agencies must first perform the work and then ask for reimbursement. Uh, to account for these emergencies, RTC has passed a resolution allowing RSTPX funds to be used as a temporary loan, such that invoices can be paid prior to receiving reimbursement from FEMA and Cal OES. Sufficient capacity exists in the RSTPX uh, fund uh, to uh, fund this contract while staff pursues disaster relief uh, funding reimbursement by FEMA and Cal OES. Uh, staff has been working uh, closely with Cal OES and FEMA um, who had inspectors on the site yesterday. Um, they're also here today. Uh, Riley Drew Brandt, I'd like to thank him for all his work. He's here today. He leave the room. He was here today, he'll be back, or maybe he won't. Maybe he ran back out to the line since his item passed on consent. Um, but uh, I, I do uh, appreciate um, uh, Commissioner Schifrin's uh, comments on uh, RTC staff, as there's been a lot of work by um, our senior engineer, Sarah Christensen, our associate engineer, Riley Gerbrandt, and our um, junior engineer, um, Brian, um, and I'm, I'm forgetting his last name, help me. Samora, um, who uh, is out there right now inspecting the rail line and, and making sure that things are getting done as expeditiously as possible. Um, I have one other um, quick update, um, and it's regarding meeting locations. Um, at the last RTC met meeting, I announced that we would be rotating meeting locations across various jurisdictions in the county, including uh, uh, county chambers um, and city halls for Watsonville, Santa Cruz, Capitola, and Scotts Valley. And that today's meeting was actually supposed to be in Watsonville. Um, at the time, uh, we understood that all of the locations had the technology in place for attendance in person or by video conference. Since then, we have learned that Watsonville has not yet implemented their virtual meeting technology um, due to various constraints and priorities. Watsonville staff has indicated it may take some time before it could make this technology available to um, RTC. Um, in light of comments made by commissioners and members of the public in the past, indicating a strong desire to maintain public virtual attendance options, today's meeting was moved here to the Board of Supervisor Chambers. At this time, staff intends to rotate meeting locations, but to only have meetings at locations where remote participation by the public can be accommodated. That said, if technical difficulties re result in the loss of communication for remote participants, RTC staff will work to restore communication. However, the meetings will continue while efforts are being made to restore communication to remote participants. Uh, we value uh, public participation and apologize in advance for any potential disruptions and for those who choose to attend via Zoom. It would be helpful if commissioners would provide feedback on whether staff's current plan to rotate meeting locations but only hold meetings where um, remote participation is uh, possible for the public is acceptable. A three month look ahead uh, for the meetings is attached to today's agenda as item number 14. As noted in the May 4th um, RTC meeting uh, will be held at the city of Capitola and we will be back here at the Board of Supervisor Chambers on June 1st. Uh, Capitoli City Chambers is quite small. Uh, it's gonna be a lot tighter up there, but I do see value in, in moving the meetings around. But I would like to hear um, Commissioner feedback. And with that, I'll hand it back to you, Chair Conant. Thank you, Executive Director Preston. Other comments or questions from commissioners? I'll just say I'm supportive of the proposed plan to rotate meetings to uh, any location that has uh, hybrid meeting capabilities and hope that Watsonville is able to outfit their city council chambers soon so that we can hold meetings down there. All right. There's no other comments or questions. Does any member of the public wishes to comment on the director's report? Seeing none here in chambers, is there anyone online? Mr. Brian Peoples. Hi, it's Brian Peoples trail now. I first want to thank RTC staff for the tremendous job they're doing on providing the remote access. Um, that's a game changer. I like to say that uh, the pandemic really forced us to the future. And I'm hopeful that the uh, commissioners are continued to allow to do the remote because I think it ought to add a lot of value. Um, the other thing I wanted to comment on is, um, is 
the director's report on the cost of maintaining the branch line and, and the continued damage to that in Harkin Slough, for example, and the, the fact that we're not using that valuable transportation resource today. And it's um, our community has been waiting and needing that transportation corridor. It's been almost a decade and a half that we've owned that property and not having a plan. We don't even have a plan to open the corridor from Watsonville to Aptos. Um, we really need to focus on how best we could use this when we've only built 1.2 miles uh, over a decade and it costs more than widening the highway to build that trail. And that trail actually, as we heard from Joanna, is not gonna be wide enough to sustain the volume of active transportation we will have in segment nine in the central section. So again, um, I do appreciate RTC staff on the work on the hybrid meetings. Um, and I'm hopeful, or we are hopeful that we can get the coastal corridor opened in our lifetime <laughs> in, a, in a, a cost effective manner. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Peoples. Matt Farrell. Good morning, Chair Koenig and Commissioners. I just want to commend um, the D Director Preston and staff uh, for working to rotate meetings throughout the county and for his efforts to maintain remote access for all those venues. And um, I think it's very important for uh, community access to these conversations. Secondly, I'd like to say that I think it's very commendable that staff is pursuing repairs and maintenance of the branch line for the purpose not only of protecting the rail line, but also of protecting the trail. So these uh, both goals are not exclusive. They're, uh, they're connected. And I think that um, as staff has said, there's a good chance there'll be federal reimbursement through emergency disaster relief for these costs. So thank you again for your time and consideration. Thank you, Mr. Farrell. We do not have any other speakers. All right, great. Then we'll proceed with item 22, the Caltrans report. Director Eats. All right, Scott Eats here, District Director um, with Caltrans. Pleasure being here in person today. So nice to see faces. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the commission. So a few items for you today. First, just uh, um, as we have been doing, road closure update. Um, great news to report actually in that we um, we had every state route in Santa Cruz impacted with the significant storm events. Um, we let out six major contracts with work in Santa Cruz County in excess of 20 million to respond to those events. Um, but we're happy to report that all state highways in Santa Cruz are now open to traffic. Um, there are closures, as you know. Um, of note, the holiday slide area, which was closed completely um, as of last week, reopened on Friday to one-way reversing traffic control. And then there's other locations with one way to reverse reversing traffic control throughout this um, county as well. Of note, the holiday slide that we were we understand there were some challenges with the signals um, at the holiday slide area. Those were addressed on Friday, so hopefully it's functioning much better now than um, and we heard about that and tried to address it as quickly as we could. All right, I want to do a, a little bit deeper dive on one particular project this time, and that is the Scotts Creek Coastal resiliency project on Highway 1 north of Davenport. So um, in October, Caltrans signed a project initiation document which identified the cost scope and schedule for the next phase of work related to restoring the lagoon and putting in a much larger, longer bridge structure at that location to allow the lagoon to function more appropriately as well as along about a lot of other work. Um, this was accumulation of a lot of many years of work by many people. Um, and it involved a, a number of different entities and agencies. And it was a unique effort in that we focused on 
together, we focused on the larger needs at the specific location and the larger solutions that um, really were needed to occur, which were much more multifaceted than just one functional area. It was, this was not just a transportation problem and it couldn't be solved by transportation alone. There was a much larger solution that was needed to address you know, historical factors that had led to the situation we have now. So really interesting um, efforts and um, the consensus solution that was um, completed through the PID points to a much larger bridge structure than currently exists, returning the creek to its natural channel, lagoon restoration and coastal access parking. So um, the great news is that we were able to, Caltrans was able to seek funding um, through the PROTECT program and um, the CTC at the March CTC meeting allocated 4.5 million in shot funds for the PNED phase for the next phase of the project. Uh, this has been a, a lengthy effort. I won't go through the, the names, well, I will go through the names of agencies that are, and entities that have been involved. So Caltrans, um, Santa Cruz County Resource Conservation District, SCC, RTC, California Depart Department of Fish and Wildlife, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, NOAA Nymphs, the Coastal Conservancy, the California Coastal Commission, Cal Poly Swanson Ranch, and others that I'm sure I'm missing. Um, it's a lengthy list. Um, and there's others that make up the Integrated Watershed Technical Advisory Committee. So a lot of folks involved in the fact that we were able to reach consensus is an impressive achievement. So uh, the other thing that's happened is uh, the, the Caltrans, the RTC, and the Resource Conservation District kicked off the Coastal Hazards Study, which was funded through a, a grant by California Fish and Wildlife which um, will develop a technical analysis to support sea level rise and coastal hazards analysis in the same area. So much work remains. The consensus solution is very impressive and very costly. And so this is a good start in the right, <clears throat> in the right direction in terms of all these different funds coming together and the efforts that have led to this point. Um, but much work remains to secure the funding that we need for the future phases of work. We'll be in the PNED phase for a few years. Um, and we continue um, to, to look forward to working with others, um, including the RTC, to see um, what we can do to fund the next phases of work. We'll certainly be looking towards competitive funding sources as well um, with other entities. So just want to do a little bit deeper dive on that one. It's pretty exciting and interesting effort that's close to home. And then the last thing I want to say is um, there's an overview of key projects in your packet. It's on PDF page 117 in the packet or item 22. We include this every month and it's a status update on key projects with recent changes are shown in bold. So you can do a quick study and see which changes there have been since the last time. And now I also want to highlight that the, that it also includes key points of contacts for inquiries that are Caltrans related as well as how to submit a customer service request. So if you see a pothole out there or something else that needs to be addressed, we call it a CSR or customer service re, uh, request. You can see the link online um, to be able to submit that. And then there's other online resources as well. So that concludes my report. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Director Eats. Commissioner Shipman. Yes, thank you for that re, uh, more detailed report on the status of the Scott Creek project. Um, Supervisor Cummings, it's within his district. It's a priority in the office, as you know. And so it's exciting to see that the project has been awarded um, Four and a half million dollars for the next phase. I one question is what is the next phase? I know there are multiple phases that have already occurred, and it really is an exciting cooperative effort between environmental agencies and Caltrans and transportation agencies to try to do a project that improves the transportation, public safety, and yet really enhances the environmental quality of that area. Um, so what will the $4.5 million cover? So the $4.5 million will cover the primary work products that would be in Caltrans wheelhouse in terms of how we develop projects. So that the, the PNED phase stands for project approval and environmental documents. So in that we study a formal range of alternatives. We complete an environmental document, all the technical studies that are needed to support the environmental, um, the environmental documents are completed at that time, as well as more detailed engineering studies 
that would ultimately lead to a project report in our world, which is an engineering document that um, identifies cost, scope, and schedule in more details. It's about a 30% design work product. Um, and then the environmental document, which of course there's, depending on the level of environmental document, it would have a public hearing, draft environmental document release, and then ultimately a final environmental document. Thank you, that's uh, very helpful. So if I'm understanding correctly, at the end of this phase, there'll be maybe an EIR, EIS, or environmental assessment. There'll be 30% drawings. And so there'll be a, a project that can then go after construction funding. Is that how it normally works with Caltrans? That uh, once you have the environmental document, you have some sense of what it might end up costing, then it's possible to start to seek the funding for construction. Is that, is my understanding of the process somewhat correct? Somewhat correct. Okay, so totally can, correct You me. can start seeking funding. Uh, there is another phase before you get to construction. So there's um, the design, the final, what we call final design phase. There's also a right-of-way phase, which goes in parallel with the final design phase, depending on what right-of-way needs there are. Um, so the, the final design phase would, so you, at the end of the P&ED phase, you have a preferred alternative that comes to the environmental document in the project report. And so then in the final design phase, you know you're only working on one preferred alternative. You're focusing on that work, getting it to 100% design, all the right-of-way clearances that you need, all the permits that you need, and then, um, then you're ready to move into construction. So during the design phase, you would be working to seek funding for the construction phase. Do you have, thanks, do you have any uh, estimate of how long this next phase is gonna take? I should have that in front of me, but I do not. So I, it's usually, if, depending on the level of environmental document, which is usually driving the schedule, um, two to three years is probably um, likely for something like this, but and usually longer. Will the work be done in house, or will it be? Will Caltrans hire a consultant to do the I at least the environmental document? I believe the work will be done in house. Director Preston is shaking his head, so that gives me comfort. Uh, it's, it's shop funds. You require your shop funds yeah. to, to be done in-house. True. However, this is a really unique situation where even some of the technical work will not necessarily all be done by Caltrans because there's some parallel technical studies with related to lagoons, look at restoration and other things that are happening associated with the lagoon, which is not something that Caltrans is usually working on, not that we can't handle some of that work, but um, this is again, a bit out of our wheelhouse in terms of the other aspects of the projects that are not transportation related. However, we'll be coordinating with this group, making sure we have the supporting technical studies, some of which may or may not be done by Caltrans, most of which will. It's a unique project in that Caltrans owns, of course, the highway and the bridge, and they'll be doing that, I'm sure, in-house. But um, when you start looking at the lagoon, it stretches you know, beyond Caltrans property, and there's a lot of desire by the resource agencies to be very involved in the technical studies to ensure the uh, proper function of the lagoon with a, with a longer bridge. So there will be some work by consultants outside of um, uh, the work being done by Caltrans, but Caltrans will lead the bridge design. And the, co and the, the grant will cover that other work? <laughs> My understanding that it, it it does, but I um I know that we're seeking additional funds because there's a desire by a lot of the resource agencies to uh, design to a higher level. Um, they feel they need that um, additional detail to ensure the proper functionality of the um, restored ecosystem. Appreciate the commission giving me some time to follow up on this. This is a unique and innovative project uh, with Caltrans working very closely with uh, environmental agencies to try to come up with a solution that solves everybody's problems. It's been in the works for years. And one of the reasons I really appreciate the report today is it's been very difficult to follow exactly what's happening when. So um, the fact that it's now moving into the, the production of the, the preparation of environmental document is very gratifying. Um, and, you know, I understand that with the complexity and with everybody's finger in the pot, it's going to take a while. But it's I just want to give our encouragement to keep the process moving. Uh, it, would be, it will really be exciting when this project reaches completion. Thank you. 
Thank you, Commissioner Shepard. One follow-up question. Do we have any estimate of how much this project is going to cost? I know it's still a very early phase, but... I was afraid to ask that question. <laughs> I don't have an estimate today, but we can get that okay. number for you. Just be a preliminary estimate. All right. Any other comment, uh, comments or questions by commissioners? Mr. Chair, just Mr. wanted Mr. to mention, um, I, I noticed in the, the monthly report, uh, as usual, more than half of the projects are in or adjoining of my fifth district. And so uh, that shows you what, what damage there is up there, especially on highways 9, 236, and 17. But I, I just wanted to give an extra shout out. We thanked so many people, but last night at uh, town hall meeting, Zeke Delamus from your, your agency, spent more time at the mic, understandably, than anybody else. And he was uh, is very well received and uh, people understood the situation much clearer. So thank you for that. Thank you, Commissioner McPherson. Are there any comments from members of the public? Yes, please approach the podium. Good morning. Um, thank you for that report. Uh, at last night's meeting, I want to also um, add on to what the supervisor just said. Out of the six emergency contracts and the $21 million expanded, uh, over $18 million of that was in District 5. And to Mr. Rockin's earlier point, yes, I was the city traffic engineer in the city of Santa Cruz in the 1982 storms and had the uh, unenviable uh, one of those people rolls to replace the Soquel Avenue bridge where half of that bridge uh, fell into the river, uh, leaving only eastbound lanes. And it did take two years to widen and replace and um, raise the level of that bridge as we did to many other bridges. So once again, I will say that out of all of this emergency work that is going quickly, in some cases, bridges take years. And there's two bridges known as the twin bridges that are nearing 100 years old on Highway 9. One of them is 20 feet wide travel lanes. That's 10 in each direction, carrying the type of traffic we have. The other bridges I mentioned, the Glen Arbor Bridge, I'm hearing that it's sinking. And the Quail Hollow Bridge, you can actually, uh, it's called the Zianni Creek Bridge over Quail Hollow Road. It has also been the, a de facto Highway 9 bridge when Glen Arbor was closed along with Highway 9. The Quail Hollow Bridge, you can actually see the rebar on the surface deck. And Matt Machado assured me last night that he would be looking into making sure it's strengthening. We have to look at multimodal funding besides bridge replacement funding since we are widening for the benefit of bikes and peds on our our um, critical infrastructure thank you thank you i see no other comments here in the chambers anyone online there's a comment on the district director's report we do not have any speakers all right thank you director eats we'll now proceed with item 23 the go santa cruz county program update I'd like to invite up transportation planners, Amanda Marino and Amy Naranjo. We're pulling up a presentation. We don't see her. If you've got slides, we don't see them just yet. Yeah. All right. Yeah. It looks like. Okay. Here we go. All right. Well, good morning, commissioners and members of the public. Uh, my name is Amanda Marino, and I'm a transportation planner for the RTC. And today I'm going to be providing you a program update um, for the Go Santa Cruz County program. Go Santa Cruz County is the RTC's carpool matching, multimodal trip planning, and commuter rewards platform. The backbone of our platform runs on Ride Amigo's cloud based commuter management software. The platform includes a mobile app and web based user dashboard where participants can track their commutes and progress towards personal goals in one convenient place. 
The primary focus of the program is to reduce single occupancy vehicle trips and greenhouse gas emissions in Santa Cruz County and to support the efficiency of the existing transportation system by providing information and resources for, sus for sustainable transportation options. Participants must first create a commuter profile at mycruise511.org to begin earning rewards um, for their alternative transportation commutes. Once re registered, participants can earn 10 points for every walk, bike, carpool, transit, or telecommute trip logged on the platform. Once the user earns 250 points, they can exchange their points for a $10 gift card, and that's capped at $100, uh, $100 annually per year. Staff also runs monthly drawings where participants have the chance to win a $25 Visa gift card for logging alternative uh, commute trips, which can be used at local retailers. One of the features available on the Go Santa Cruz County platform is the, the ability to create com commuter networks for individual employers. Interested organizations can create a commuter network for free customized employer-based um, countywide functions that'll be under the county net parent network. This would connect employees with commute options, offer additional incentives, and track organization savings, carbon emissions, reductions, and more. This can be managed by the employer themselves or um, by RTC staff. In addition, RTC partners with Ecology Action to offer the following commuter, um, commuter workshops to participating employers. We offer urban, urban bicycling, urban commuting 101, intro to e-bikes, and the new 2022 winter riding workshop. Workshops are tailored to an organization's specific needs and participants must enroll in the Go Santa Cruz County program to receive a free bike helmet and light set. Currently, there are 4,760 or 76 uh, participants enrolled in the Go Santa Cruz County program with close to 1,800 new user registrations since January 2022. Participants have logged more than 100,000 walk, bike, carpool, van, van pool, transit, and telecommute trips burning over 10 million calories. And that's also saving 215 metric tons of carbon, um, carbon emissions and 300,000 in commute saving costs. Prospective carpoolers have sent 588 messages to prospective ride matches with the platform. So this, yeah, this chart is included in attachment one of the staff report and shows the new user registration by quarter since 2022. New user growth remains steady in 2022, averaging 330 new users per quarter. New user registrations have increased by 42% this year compared to last year's quarterly average. One of the challenges we face is providing sufficient incentives for participants countywide to incentive, incentivize continuous participation in the program. The spread of COVID-19 brought with it, among other countless challenges, wide ranging implications for employers and their commute programs for the past few years. Transportation choices narrowed, including, for example, the discontinuation of the Santa Cruz bike share program. We are excited for 2023 that now that e-bike e share is coming back, as well as more community events um, to attend to to spread the word about our program. In the coming months, staff uh, plans to participate in the, in the following um, events. We have Bike Month in May, Midtown Fridays throughout the summer, Pleasure Point Street Fair in June, Open Streets in October, and the Santa Cruz County Chamber Business Expo in September. We will also be working with our marketing firm, Miller Maxfield, to create new promotional materials in both English and in Spanish. Refresh our email and social media campaigns, and promote the Go Santa Cruz County promo video that was released in late 2022. The RTC is currently partnering with the Santa Cruz Metro to support the launch of the One Ride at a Time campaign that was mentioned earlier. For every 25 trips logged in our platform, participants can earn a $10 reward and can choose to donate it to the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary Fund or the Bay of Life Fund. 
Metro is leading the campaign with uh, one ride at a time in Go Santa Cruz County promotional materials, social media outreach, community events, and wrap bu buses of the Monterey Bay that is from the Bay of Life project. There is growing support nationally to accelerate the adoption of e-bikes to make healthy green transportation options more affordable. California Air Resources Board, other night, or CARB, um, the state has a statewide electric bicycle incentives project that will be providing up to 10 million worths of vou vouchers available for Californians to pur purchase a class one, two, or three e-bike, but demand for vouchers are likely um, going to exceed available funding. The Monterey Bay Air Resources District Regional Electric Bicycle Incentive Program exhausted all of its fiscal year 2022-2023 funds in August 2022 and is no longer accepting applications. The MBARD Board of Direct, um, sorry, the Monterey Bay Area Resources District Regional Electric Bicycle Ex Incentive um, is going to be meeting on April 19th to discuss this and in, it, to be continued in fiscal year 2023-2024. The Electric Bicycle Incentive Kickstart for the Environment, otherwise known as the E-Bike Act, was introduced by California Congressman Jimmy Panetta last month. This would provide refundable federal income tax rebate of up to 30% 30, 30 of the cost of buying an e-bike capped at $1,500. Mm -hmm. Staff will be following the status of the E-Bike Act and statewide e-bike rebate pro program and promote these options with our Go Santa Cruz County participants. All right. So the City of Santa Cruz Electric Bike Incentive Program administered by Ecology Action is limited to individuals who work downtown or who also work for the City of Santa Cruz. As a result, more than 600 individuals who applied, including 250 plus income qualified, were not eligible for these incentives. Therefore, our TC staff is exploring options to build upon the success of the downtown e-bike rebate program. More information about this program can be found on attachment four in the packet. Staff are considering expanding the Go Santa Cruz e-bike rebate program to income qualified county reg residents, presenting an opportunity for equitable access to electric bikes and or regular bikes in Santa Cruz County. This would leverage the city's investment in setting up the rebate program. So staff is recommending that the commission provide input on the possibility of a pilot program to provide e-bike or classic bike, bike vouchers. Staff is also recommending to approve the attached resolution, which is included as attachment five, to authorize the executive director to extend the contracts with Miller Maxfield and Ecology Action and approve the fiscal year 2022-2023 budget amendment shown as exhibit A. And that concludes my presentation and our team um, is also welcome to have happy to answer any questions. We have Ecology Action staff and Miller Maxfield staff available as well. Thank you. Thank you, Planner Marino. Are there comments or questions from commissioners? Commissioner Schifrin and then Commissioner Johnson. I wanted to ask, um, I think it's very exciting um, to be considering moving more um, actively into pro providing maybe countywide vouchers for income qualified people for e-bikes. But um, as I think staff knows, there are many lower income people in the community who live in situations where there's no place to safely store an e-bike. So would you talk a little bit about uh, the potential of having uh, rebates to users of the bike share program when that's set up and uh, if there's some way the commission can be helpful in uh, supporting that because I think uh, it, I think it is a way of really encouraging people to not take their cars take their bikes but not having to uh, lay out a bunch of money in advance and try to figure out a safe place to store them so yeah, um, Amy and I have been discussing also providing maybe some sort of incentive for the e-bike share program. 
um, we want to talk to city uh, of Santa Cruz staff to figure out what the best option um, would look like and the cost estimates for that, potentially doing a discount code or some sort of free month um, of bike share. But we definitely um, are excited about that program and want to get users on board with that as well. Could I follow up and ask, is the, I, I forget where the RTC itself can apply to the air board for uh, funding for alternative um, programs that reduce greenhouse gases. Maybe. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, well, I, I, I mean, it used to be that uh, the the air board would fund a lot of bicycle uh, uh, programs, uh, but. Um, um, we're not sure how, how much um, they actually offer now for bicycle programs. We can certainly talk to them about that. And one of the challenges that for the for the air district has been um, uh, obtaining uh, uh, data that uh, shows that the funds that they provide uh, actually do reduce um, uh, emissions. And, and that's one of the things that they are they are um, you know thinking about and considering whether they will extend their electric bike. Uh, uh, incentive program because they feel that that without doing a lot of administrative work it uh it might be challenging it to really demonstrate that uh, these incentives actually do what what everyone would thinks or would like them to do so i'm understanding from your response that the rtc can apply for funding i don't know I, okay so you sorry. avoided my question all right well. sorry about that. but let, let me just say that in answer to the substance of what you said um it would seem to me that a voucher program using bike share would really provide data because uh you'd only use vouchers for people who actually use the electric bikes um because it would reduce the cost that they're paying and the company that was running the program would, I'm sure, as part of their contract, be keeping uh, data statistics on how many people are using it, how often they're using it. And that is all data that could justify to the air board how much um, bikes are being used. And um, partially that I think that provides evidence of uh, reduction in greenhouse gases. Obviously, maybe there'd have to be some survey about whether people have stopped using their cars to use the bikes, but it's definitely it's definitely going to reduce the trips that uh, that people would otherwise take in other ways. I don't know if the executive director wanted to respond to that. Yeah, we had um, extensive conversations about this um, in, in preparing the staff report. Um, and I was quite surprised to hear that um, uh, they weren't continuing the program part in part because they didn't ha have the evidence that it was actually reducing the amount of vehicle trips. Um, as we discussed it, um, I couldn't help but think about the um, application that we do have um, and that um, by using that application, we could actually obtain the data that they're looking for. So I do plan on contacting the Air Board and seeing what opportunities exist and whether there um, that there's some flexibility in their willingness to to continue to promote um, uh, rebates for either bicycle purchases or for uh, vouchers for bike share. You refer to the application we do have. Is that the online? That's, our, that's, our, app, application? that's our app. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So people could use that potentially to rent a bike and we could have them have to respond. How would you have made this trip if this bike was not available? And it could be a car in which then we would be able to provide them with the data they're looking for. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Schiffer. And I will add, I was actually just made aware yesterday that um, there are some, sounds like the university is offering some pretty significant discounts to its students for the um, bike share program that's about to be released. Uh, I don't know exactly the details, but I think there's, you know, with the new B cycle program, you'll be able to buy something like a one year, uh, 30 minute, uh, unlimited 30 minute uh, rides for you know, something in the neighborhood of $150. Whereas through as for your university student, you'll be able to have unlimited 60 minute rides for something in the 10 to $20 range. So 30, $30, 12 dollars. Okay. That's what I that's what I thought I heard, but it was um so remarkably low. I couldn't <laughs> believe it. So I mean, 
I'd be interested to understand the details of that contract and if it's something that we could uh, extend, you know, specifically to applicants, maybe who applied for the e-bike rebates um, or who we've identified have a relatively short commute um, where they could utilize a bike instead or who might be able to take bike to school or something to that effect. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. I was interested in how um, the income qualification is administered. I mean, tax returns, or how do you how do you determine that? So our partners, um, our partners uh, process the applications, and when when uh, you need a a mic. Oh, okay. Uh, so when applicants submit their their application, there's a there's a question on the form that asks them to. They need to provide some sort of um, confirmation that they're enrolled in an, in another income-based program, um, whether it's pg e CARES, Medi-Cal, or CARES, forget some of the other programs' names, but they provide their proof via that. So it's like a passport to right. be able to. Um, I was, I think I was at the, with some friends at Cat and Cloud. Next door was, a, I think, a shop called Gazelle. Um, beautiful bikes, right? Um, and the people that we were with were from Carlsbad, and it brought up a conversation that there have been many, many accidents uh, involving e-bikes, and uh, the mo majority of these, and even some deaths, are when the these bikes are transferred to perhaps teenagers or kids who go to school who don't know the rules of the road. So, are there any limitation on who once these once e-bikes are you know, bought and used. Um, is there any qualification that says, you know, you have to kind of know the rules of the road in order to use these? For, yeah, the city of Santa Cruz for their e-bike um, e rebate program, they require to take an educational um, course okay. on e-bikes um, and that's administered through Ecology Action. So that is a requirement in order to receive a rebate. Um, but the the age requirement, I think you just have to work. You have to work downtown um, and uh, to to be eligible. Um, I'm not exactly exactly sure if there's an age requirement, but maybe Matt would be able to. Okay, yeah, okay. eighteen. Right. Commissioner Peterson, thank you. Um, um, I think this is a great program, but I I also would be worried about. Um, issues with extremely low income access, um, especially because they will need to buy the bike up front and then wait for a rebate. I'm wondering if there's been any um, talk about a possible like a loan program to subsidize that. So the upfront cost could be um, more accessible to a wider range of applicants. Yeah, so there's a there's a couple of options there. So first of all, the the downtown program and and in, in which we're looking to expand is uh, is a point of sale voucher. So the applicants apply for the apply um, either get confirmation and then um, they choose their bike and then they get the voucher itself. So they complete the education course, then they get the actual voucher. They take that voucher with them to the bike shop, pick up their bike, and then that that voucher or that rebate amount is. Taken, taken off the, mm -hmm. the total at the time of purchase. Um, similar, the statewide uh, e-bike rebate is also a point of sale purchase. So uh, applicants apply, get approved in advance, and then get the funds up front before actually putting it down or putting paying for the bike. So it's a way to limit the amount of up upfront mm -hmm. cost for, for, for an e-bike. Great, thanks. And I'd also uh, encourage looking into uh, rebate programs for the bike share as well. I think that would be a great idea. <laughs> Other comments? We've got, Ms. We've got a bunch of people now. Oh, all right. <laughs> all right, we'll start with Commissioner Montesino. Yeah, so, um, you know, a great opportunity, but like I said, it interests a lot in, in the low income bracket and we can advertise it more because, you know, all this, all the stuff that you, that you, you have outlined here, it's all Santa Cruz based. So, um, where are the uh, Watsonville opportunities, South County opportunities to it? Um, because, you know, advocates uh, from the bike community, you know, state a lot, a lot of efforts. But um, uh, what we see on the ground, there's no, uh, there's no advertisements, there's no opportunities. Like I said, all these outreaches are Santa Cruz based. Right. Um, so 
what are you going to do to enhance that? Yeah. Um, so in, in the past, we've, we've, we've looking at different opportunities where we can go and promote outreach at existing events. So many of the events that we are participating are, are based in, in and around Santa Cruz. Uh, last year, we, we partnered with uh, Equity Transit and, and did our promotion and outreach uh, in downtown Watsonville. And then as we continue moving forward with, uh, with the program, as well as a potential e-bike program in marketing that, we would work with our marketing consultants to help us develop the, the outreach and the promotions where we can go specifically in downtown, or specifically in Watsonville in that, in that general area and do some more outreach. And our partners at Ecology Action also have um, a, new, a new community workshop facilitator who can um, provide more of the workshops in, in English and Spanish. And that wasn't something that we had access to prior. So. Uh, well, uh, just to follow up, I mean, the, one of the greatest venues in our, in our community is like um, uh, the uh, Fiesta Spa, the Cinco de Mayo, and in September, and the Strawberry Festivals, which we're all missing, you know, uh, in action. Right. Uh, in our, <laughs> We actually looked gets, at, and that's what gets a lot of the community there in the downtown area. You don't have to look for them; they're there. Yeah. So those uh, are those are opportunities of, uh, available to us. But one of the disparities uh, that I saw in the outline also is, is in the uh, and this is a different conversation. But in the parking rights, we don't. You know, we want to get people off. You know, the uh, car trips, and we don't provide a parking ride in Watsonville. Um, where we keep putting off and off and off and off. And that's one of the things that would probably get you, you know, some trips off the road. So this uh, it's a potential, uh, you know, future conversation on that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Hernandez. I, I think I just want to piggyback off of uh, Commissioner Montesino's comments. Um, but in terms of the e-bikes, you know, it'd be great if we can expand that program in South County. And I think the perfect opportunity is, of course, the city of Watsonville, but also once the West Marine um, buildings open up, I think that's a, also a perfect opportunity because we'll have a lot of South County residents that will live and work there as well as instead of commuting to Santa Cruz to 701 Ocean or Emmeline. So that'll be a perfect opportunity as well as the Freedom uh, Campus. Uh, that'd be also another opportunity to expand the, the bike programs and all the other programs, but especially the e-bike program. Uh, th this this con is considered part of the downtown, right? 701 Ocean for the bike program as well? Um, I don't think it's in the par downtown parking district. Oh, okay. Well, the city of Watson has a parking district too, if we can... I mean, I, I think they got, they, yeah, they just established a parking district, so that'd be perfect, too. Another opportunity. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Rockin. I, I want to appreciate that uh, this program includes uh, this uh, ride tracking aspect and recognize that uh, when the transit district set up the one ride at a time program, we didn't have to start from scratch developing a way that people could report their rides. It already existed to the RTC. and. Uh, Manu at the um, at the event, sort of on the one ride at a time thing. Actually, I was really impressed. Went through and act, taught everybody in the room how to actually use the app, and uh, it was I thought really really useful. And uh, to actually have that, you know, something as concrete as that. This is how you get on this app. This is how you record your rides and participate in the program. And it it, it we did this program in six months, a little under six months, and. If we had had to start from scratch building, a, you know, how are our, how can our riders report their rides and who's going to do it and how are we going to gather the data? It would have been years. And so it really is helpful to have this program set up ahead of time and we could just join it. It was really great. Thank you, Commissioner Rockin. Commissioner Brown. <laughs> Thank you. Um, really great to hear your presentation and to see all of the progress that's been made. Uh, this is a program that uh, makes a really big difference with uh, uh, what I would consider to be a nominal investment relative to a, a lot of what we do here. And so I wanted to ask, and I absolutely support expanding the program countywide. Um, I love the idea of the Watsonville Parking District also putting in so we can get as many sources together to, um, to create a, a seamless system. And uh, you said you're working on uh, this and that there are, um, you know, some, some possibilities. Um, if, if you could talk a little bit more about that, because I, I want to make sure that you get the support. 
uh, that you need to make this happen. And if it means that the, the commission uh, might consider uh, funding this uh, for, for as part of the pilot um, and, and then how long you think it might take to, to move in this direction, I'd love to see this happen quickly. I, I know of some opportunities with um, some bikes that we can possibly use through this program at a lower cost. And, and so it just seems like a really great investment and wanna hear a little more about um, working on it. Yeah, um, so one one of the first things that we need to identify, um, we, we know that there is a demand. Um, we, we found that in the downtown program, there were more than 650 applicants who, who couldn't apply for the program. Um, and 250 of those or plus were, were income qualified applicants who were, were looking to, to get this program. So we're, we're looking first for a funding source. Um, we've, we've, looked, we've, we've talked with management, we've looked at the, the budget and the potential that we, we see at, at the moment is either applying for either RST, or, um, STBG or RSTPX funds. That's a, that's a mouthful. Um, and, and potentially applying for this, for this concept project uh, in the consolidated call for projects in the fall. Um, so that's one, that's kind of one item there. It's seeing what, what funding we have available and how much we have available. And then that takes us to the next step is, well, what type of eligibility criteria would we determine? Is that going to be similar and in line with the state's eligibility criteria? Um, or would we make it more in line with the downtown program, which has a, a lower incentive? Um, and then, and then that takes us into the next question or the next option, which is the voucher amounts. Um, would, would they be, you know, really substantial, and that would then help really help a lower income individual actually purchase a bicycle up front and having a larger incentive, or just making more incentives available at a, at a lower um, a lower amount. And and then finally, it's uh, and then and then also deciding is it going to be e bike only, or is it e bikes and standard bicycles, and having either options and having uh, vouchers available for both. And then finally, it's uh, bringing this item and, and some of our our criteria and our and our draft ideas uh, to our RTC committees and and just out to the public in general um, for their input and and how do we build this program and making it um, cost effective and equitable to to all individuals throughout the county. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I think I'm good. Right. Okay. <laughs> Got it. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Brown. Um, I'll just add a few comments. Which is first is uh, just really to appreciate the program, I and mean, I think it's uh, pretty telling that in our Measure D expenditure plan, even under the highway funds, voters approved transportation met a demand management program like this. So um, very forward looking, and of course, it's been mentioned other times during the meeting, it was really that multimodal approach that has helped our county win uh, such incredible state and federal grants recently. And so um, you know, it's great that we also are doing it through the, the software and transportation demand management side. Um, I would also echo, uh, Commissioner Hernandez's comments that I think the new county facility um, in South County is a great opportunity to pursue a park and ride location. It's very close to the highway um, and you know, it could be, a, it'll be a natural jobs hub itself and uh, hopefully will also be a great place for park and ride. So I'd invite you to reach out to uh, County General Services and Real Property to discuss that. Um, you mentioned some of the challenges with continued use. Um, could you talk a little bit about how many monthly active users we have on the app? Yeah, um, I emailed you that information and I didn't Good. put it right here on my notes. Uh, I, I, uh, I can read it if you want, I just want to give you the opportunity. To... Sure, go ahead and read that. I don't have that in my notes right here. Okay, okay, sure. So, I mean, you mentioned about, I think, 4,076 total signups for the Ride Amigos platform. However, um, looking at it a month by month basis, how many people are using the app, uh, the average is 141 users and we had a high uh, in the last year of 202 users. So I just want to point out that is about one, even if we look at the higher number, the high of 202 users per month, that's 5% of everyone that signed up is using the app on a regular basis or one in 20. So this may I just I think we're going to recognize the possibility. This may not be the most effective way to encourage people to reduce their to, or, or have the biggest impact on the community to reduce trips. Right? Is the opportunity to track rides? Um, I mean, I recognize that 
no matter what program we have, we need the Go Santa Cruz um, umbrella and marketing program, and we need great partners like Ecology Action to help promote the program. But uh, I think we should over the next year, I mean, we're launching the one ride at a time campaign with Metro. Uh, hopefully that will have, we'll see an impact. Uh, I think that over the next year, we do need to look at potential alternatives uh, as far as like really the core of this program. Um, if it's you know literally just giving away more e-bikes or giving people the opportunity to uh, ride at a greatly reduced cost on the, um, on the bike share program or anything else. Um, so that's, what I'm hoping that we'll see. Um, I, I think that when I say, you know, the year time frame, my understanding is that the, the contract we have with Ride Amigos is for another year, right? It was a two year contract. We approved it last year. Okay. Um, and of course, we're, we're rolling out the one ride at a time campaign now. We'll see what impact that has. So I think by the time this comes back to us next year, I'd like to see some of these other options as far as how we can directly invest some of the funds that we're currently using for this program, as well as potentially other options. Um, you know, coming down the line from uh, federal actions as well as uh, state actions that we could plug into this program. Actually, my final question is, as far as the, um, what is it, CARB, the state program for bike vouchers, uh, is there any, and I know it was in the list in the report, uh, the entity that was going to help distribute those vouchers. Do they need like local partners? Uh, how, how does that work? Pedal ahead, right? Pedal ahead, based out of San Diego, is operating the entire statewide platform. They're handling all the applications, review, and then disbursement of, of those vouchers. Um, and then by bike retailers are can also participate and, and apply to be a, a participating vendor. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah. Are they like limited by region, like a per capita number, or is it just however many people apply, they give them out until we, they're all gone? Oh, so I think um, about 50% of the funds are are set aside for low low income priority populations, um, and so they'll the all the rebates will be on a first come first serve basis up until they reach that 50% uh, limit uh, of where funds have been claimed. 50% of the funds have been claimed, and then after that, it'll just be based on uh, the priority criteria. Okay. We'll show a little competitive streak here. You know, I want to get as many of these vouchers for Santa Cruz County residents as possible. I mean, particularly, I think in in the first district in the Live Oak area, there's a lot of great opportunities to get bikes into uh, the the hands of low income folks who who have maybe relatively shorter commutes. So I'd hope that um, you know, given that two thirds of the folks who applied for the downtown program, which is very limited, doesn't include the even 701 Ocean Street here. Maybe we could reach out to them directly and say, hey, there's a new opportunity. Go ahead and apply for this, or you know, somehow communicate with Pedal Ahead. Um, you know, any way to sort of use the information we've already collected to to, to jump uh, to the next level faster would be great. Absolutely. Those are all my comments. If there's no one else on the commission, then we'll open it for public comment. Yeah, push the podium, please. Hi everyone. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. Yeah, it's morning. Hey, Matt Miller here from Ecology Action. Thanks so much. Uh, good to see you all here. I wanted to address a few things, but uh, among them, Commissioner Peterson, you had some questions about the, the voucher versus reimbursement model as well as uh, financing. So I just wanted to kind of color in some detail from, uh, from the downtown program. So we have a base rebate of $400 and we have an income qualified rebate of $800. Uh, and so it's a voucher style program where people are guaranteed if they're eligible, they go through the program requirements, they fill out a baseline survey, they complete the bike safety education, uh, and then they are given their voucher and they can use that and it's immediately deducted from the price. But what we've seen is that 85% of the people who've come through the program have taken advantage of other e-bike incentive programs like MBARD, 3CE, sometimes both of those last summer all three of those programs were functioning. Uh, so a wide majority of people are stacking rebates to make it all possible. Um, we also have had 31% of people come through who are low income uh, at, at the point of pre-approval, but the actual conversion rate is 43% of people are actually low income who've gone through the entire process. So we have actually a disproportionately higher number of low income individuals who are using the program. Uh, and
And in terms of financing, what we've seen is a couple of things. One, many of the local bike shop retailers have uh, a zero interest. Most of them have a zero interest and a couple have very low interest uh, bike loans that people have taken advantage of. And then through the Ecology Action Membership Program, which covers the downtown parking district, we have a zero interest e-bike loan up to $1,500, which people who have come through the rebate program have taken advantage of to make the whole the whole picture work so yes financing is being utilized and then also the voucher style program just gives that guarantee up front a couple of things that happened that we observed last summer is that right as mbard was running out of funding people had made the purchase applied and didn't get funding because it ran out and it put people on a really difficult spot so having a voucher style program guarantees that you have it in hand uh, and you don't have to worry about that 30 60 day reimbursement window or potentially not get that money back at all so a voucher style program that the downtown program runs on would be a in our uh in our strong opinion would be a great model for rolling out a countywide program and also, like many rebate programs, stacking them makes that whole picture work quite well. So as we're thinking about what's going to happen with the statewide rebate, I agree, uh, Commissioner Koenig, hopefully we can get a lot of that, but there's maybe 10,000 vouchers available in that program and millions of people. So what can the county do fo you know, to focus and, and really build on a successful downtown program? Um, I think we've got a lot of really strong indicators that it's working, that it's effective, that it's replacing car trips, that it's reducing emissions, and it's changing transportation behavior. So let's keep that momentum and bring it to the entire county, building off this pilot that we've been working on the last year and a half. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else here in chambers wish to comment? Is there anyone online? We have Matt Farrell. Thank you, Chair Koenig and Commissioners. I just want to speak uh, in favor of this evolution of the GO Santa Cruz program. Uh, it is really important for it to have a regional focus. Um, and what commissioners from South County has spoken to is definitely an area that needs attention and energy. But I think, you know, every journey is a series of steps and this is a big step forward. Uh, finally, I'd say that this is really a critical component, this regional approach for an effective bike share program. When individual communities were pursuing bike share individually, it had huge impacts on uh, the ability of people to use the vehicles. So thank you to everyone who's worked on this project. I think um, for a lot of working people, an electric bicycle is a real opportunity. And I'd just like to mention that one thing in talking with people about bicycling, one barrier to um, Riding in traffic for people is that the bicycle has a hard time competing with vehicle speed. And a lot of people feel more secure on an electric bicycle. So I think this will help move people to this mode. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Farrell. Equity Transit. Hi, I'd like to thank Santa Cruz County Go RTC team for the vital work that you've been doing to move our community out of their cars and onto bikes, buses, and carpooling to address our climate crisis. Uh, just wondering if Go might consider doing a short online training video just to help new people get onboarded in Spanish and English. And uh, we really appreciated the Go Santa Cruz County hosting an educational table at our National Transit Equity Day Festival in Watsonville. Uh, we're really excited to see all the partnerships that Go is fostering with Ecology Action and Metro and others. Um, I also wanted, and it was great to hear Matt from Ecology Action talk about um, e-bike stacking of rebates or the um, ability uh, of vouchers, and that's really exciting because, as many of us know, it's so expensive to live here. Even people who are not necessarily considered low income need ways of being able to get access to these bikes financially. It's been hard for for most everybody. 
Um, and also I'd be re remiss to not mention that Santa Cruz County has one of the highest rates of traffic violence in the states. Um, many people in our community that I've spoken to would love to get on their bikes and get around, but they don't because of the aggressive driving and unsafe streets. So just want to give a plug for prioritizing infrastructure that prioritizes the safety of all on our roads rather than our current typical infrastructure that prioritizes speed and hope that you'll look at when road work projects go in and narrowing streets, fully separated bike, um, bike lanes, adding visual and physical deterrence to speed. For example, we can plant trees and while we remediate um, the removal of trees in another area, we can provide a service of uh, that is both climate addressing and safety addressing on our streets with trees and other ways. So again, thank you, Go Santa Cruz County for all your work. And I look forward to seeing you at all the upcoming events. Thank you, Ms. Faulkner. Piet. Hello, commissioners. It's Piat Cannon with Ecology Action. Um, I'd like to address a couple of points um, about e-bike rebate programs in the region. So MBARD's program was mentioned, and that program, um, I don't think the staff ended it. I think it ran out of funds for its fiscal year, and the fiscal year doesn't start until this July. So I think in five, in five weeks, I believe, they you know exhausted all their funds for their e-bike program. And then the other regional program run by 3CE, um, they had 1,234 um, approved applications. So that, that program was wildly successful. They did decide to end that program, um, which is a little bit of head scratcher because that was one third, one quarter of their energy program participants went through the e-bike rebate program. Um, and so those programs to me were a victim of their success. Um, and, you know, a point in case for how popular these rebate programs are. Um, so I, I would, um, you know, um, you know, encourage the commission to look at expanding the current um, downtown program for e-bike rebates to the whole county. And then also, I, I did want to also talk about um, the bike share program. If that's a crucial program coming online. I think both you can have a rebate program for electric bikes and a robust bike share program and and I, I i i would ask the commission and transportation um you know staff to think of the bike share program as a public transit program and to subsidize it as such so you can have low income rates so you can have support so you can make sure that unbanked um users can can access it that people without apps can access it so provide the support to make that program accessible to all users in Santa Cruz County from North County to South County. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Cannon. Ms. Paula Bradley, Bradley, sorry about that. Hi, everyone. I, I wanted to applaud everyone for bringing back the uh, e-bike rebate program. I think that's wonderful. Um, I also had a question about the federal tax credit. If any anyone might know it, would that be a tax credit that would only apply to those who itemize on their taxes and 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 those who do not would not be able to take advantage of that tax credit? I, I just thought it should be more equitable if if everyone who files can get the tax credit. Thank you. Thank you. I do not see any other speakers. All right, and I'll return to the commission for action. <clears throat> Go ahead, Commissioner Rockin. Of the uh, three resolutions that the staff recommends, I also would add um, directing staff to uh, continue work on the e-bike share program, uh, as referenced originally by Andy Schifrin, but others commented on it at some great length. Um, I don't have specific details to that, but you know, basically the, there's a lot of work to be done to actually put it into place. And um, finally, that uh, that we do pursue uh, airboard uh, support for the programs that we're talking about. So, uh, I would second that, but would like to add a couple of um, additional directions sort of related to that. 
And one of them would be a direction to staff to return in two months with um, program funding options for both the uh, an e-bike voucher and a bike share program um, that would, um, including the possibility of using funds from the RTC budget. Uh, I thought the comment by the uh, chair in terms of um, the various sources uh, in measure D that could be used for TDM programs is worth looking into. I'd like to also add a direction that when this returns, there be a discussion about outreach in the South County so that the commission could have a better understanding of what's being done there. So if that's acceptable to the main- Friendly amendments and part of the main motion at this point. Okay, and so if I could speak to it, the, the point of this is I think, as I think staff can see, there's a lot of support on the commission to move forward with both vouchers and um, bike share. That the intent of the motion is to try to operationalize that by having something come back that really looks at how could these programs be funded, how much uh, could be made available sooner and later, and how can it be, you know, what's a, what's potentially available both within our budget and from other sources that could um, be used to um, kickstart these programs. All right, we have a motion from Commissioner Rodkin, a second from Commissioner Schifrin. Is there any further discussion? All right, seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passed unanimously. Thank you very much. All right, we will now proceed with item 24, which is fiscal year 23-24 proposed budget. It's a presentation by Director of Finance, Tracy New. Good morning, commissioners and members of the public. Can you hear me? No, can you, can you just make sure it's on? Just press the button. I believe it's on. Maybe just getting a little closer would be would be helpful. Can you hear me now? So maybe straighten the mic and yeah, there you go. Good morning, commissioners and members of the public. RTC, my name is Tracy New. I'm part of the RTC staff here to present the fiscal year 23-24 RTC and Measure D budgets. The first fiscal year 23-24 proposed budget is presented early to allow the RTC to inform claimants of projected apportionments of Transportation Development Act funds and projected Measure D funds for use in developing their budgets. Revenue estimates for the new fiscal year include Transportation Development Act from the County Auditor, State Transit Assistance and State of Good Repair from the State Controller's Office, and Measure D from Hinderleiter Delamas Companies. Per TDA statute and the RTC's rules and regulations, TDA revenue estimates Sorry. are provided by the county in January each year. The RTC maintains an 8% reserve and is responsible for administration and allocation of revenues to eligible claimants based on a formula share. The RTC is also responsible for the allocation of state transit assistance and state of good repair revenues. Actual Measure D revenues received each month are distributed in, in accordance with the Ordinance Expenditure Plan. Hinderleiter Delamas provided an update following the FY23 quarter two results on California's retail economy based on data through December 31, 2022. Various industries experienced slight inflation improvements, but real change has yet to take hold. Consumers remain nervous about the economy. Experts vary on whether recession will occur and to what extent. HDL's forecast indicates a slowdown in taxable, taxable spending um, to 0.4% in fiscal year 23-24 as the higher cost of utilities, food, and other necessities limit dollars available for discretionary spending. Forecast considerations include inflation, interest rates, personal debt, and savings. We also have a national election in November of 2024. Unemployment is at the pre-pandemic level at 4.1%, um, which is a good thing overall for our economy. During the early months of 2023, fluctuating key indicators led many experts to draw mixed conclusions regarding the fluid economic outlook. Strong jobs numbers and low employment rates allowed consumption spending to stay solid. Recent bank closures have tested the stock market, and as a result, both investors and customers are nervous about the security and accessibility of their funds. One of the most vulnerable segments includes taxable discretionary merchandise as consumers are closely monitoring their own financial situation. 
From a sales tax perspective, HDL's forecast does not differ from recent estimates. Um, while no recession is anticipated, current year results will slow and then decelerate into little or no growth for fiscal year 23-24. Analysts are looking to the Fed and how much they've responded to cool inflation for the overall economy. Interest rates since March of last year are up 475 basis points. A lot of good information is coming out of the Fed Treasury right now with where they are overall for the rest of the calendar, calendar year, anticipating just one more bump. They are being mindful. They do not wish to push the economy into what might otherwise be considered a recession or an extreme pullback. It is not likely we will go back to fiscal year 21 and 22 growth levels that were in the double digits. For Measure D, a 1.5% transaction and use tax, the fiscal year 23, quarter two, which is October through December, experienced a 1.3% decline over fiscal year 2022, quarter two. This, this is down from the previous quarter, which saw a 4.2% growth with consumers continuing to spend and traveling for the summer months. Year-over-year -year growth is up 4% for fiscal year 23, quarter one, and quarter two through December. In fiscal year 23, quarter two, inflation and interest rates increases have a big effect on spending and the economy. Transportation Development Act is a one quarter percent sales tax that comes from the general sales tax of 7.25% general sales tax of California. In fiscal year 23, um, quarter two, which is October through December, there was a 2.6% decline over fiscal year 2022. This is down from the previous quarter, which saw a 4% increase. Year over year growth is 0.7% for um, fiscal year 23 through December 2022. The fiscal year 2022-23 approved budget for TDA included estimate revenues plus a $1.3 million in carryover revenues from the prior two fiscal years, minus funds needed for the TDA reserve fund. The amount of TDA revenues in the fiscal year 23-24 budget is only the estimated revenues of 12 million minus the funds needed for the TDA reserve fund. This results in a 12.3% decrease for RTC and Metro when compared to fiscal year 22-23. Because revenues are now coming in below estimates, it is not expected that there will be any carryover TDA funds to be distributed in fiscal year 23-24. Affecting TDA revenue starting in January 2021 was a change in reporting sales tax revenue of e-commerce. Revenues that were previously reported in the pools are now being shifted to direct allocation for e-commerce re retailers attributed to fulfillment centers. Fulfillment centers are the big warehouses that are truly fulfilling orders, often with robotics and across the state of California. They are the largest component of the business and industry group. There are over 30% now, which used to be only 20%. This has been growing consistently each quarter as more fulfillment centers come online. Sales out of those fulfillment centers are considered places of sale, then becoming direct allocations to the county the warehouse is located and come out of the pools. This change does not affect Measure D as Measure D is a district tax and we receive, it's a transactional use tax, we receive our portion on that, on those sales. Presented to the commission is the fiscal year 23-24 budget, program and project revenues and expenditures are based on the estimates for work to be completed in the coming fiscal year. The proposed fiscal year 23-24 budget is balanced and includes the funding to meet the RTC state and federally mandated responsibilities, as well as continue the RTC's priority transportation projects and programs. In June, staff will prepare an amendment to the budget based on actual spending to determine the carryover of revenues and expenditures based on work completed. The Budget and Personnel, Budget and Administration Personnel Committee met on March 9th to consider the staff recommendations present, presented in the staff report. The committee did not have a quorum, but the four commissioners who participated in the meeting did not have any objections and expressed their support for the staff recommendations. So staff recommends that the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission approve the resolution um, adopting the fiscal year 23-24 budget, accept the 23-24 trans, uh, tra uh, Transportation Development Act revenue forecast provided by the county auditor, accept the Measure D revenue forecast for fiscal year 23-24 through 27-28 provided by HDL companies, Accept the 30 year revenue projection, which incorporates the HDL forecast for fiscal year 23 24, and accept the five year revenue estimates for the Measure D recipients, which incorporate the HDL forecast for 23 24, and calculation of the revenue distribution for local jurisdictions with updated data. This concludes my report, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Director New. Comments or questions from commissioners? All right. 
Uh, Commissioner Schiffer. I just want to thank uh, staff for the work on this and it, the budget seems to get more complicated every year. Um, but um, it, it's, it, we end up doing really well in terms of our audits and beating all the requirements. And uh, you know, it, I appreciate the detailed work. While I have the floor, I forgot at the last item to uh with the last time to compliment staff on their work on the go santa cruz project i thought the staff report was very helpful um so thank you to staff on on the work on this and uh, i was at the budget and administration committee uh, uh i think it was a rainy day and there was a lot of confusion and we never ended up with it we're moving to uh, in-person meetings so we didn't get a quorum but uh those of us who were there did feel that the budget was uh worthy of support. So when it's the appropriate time, I'd be happy to make the motion to support the staff recommendations. Thank you, Commissioner Schiffer. Other comments, questions? Thank you. Uh, it is a you know sort of cautious report. We've been seeing a little bit of slowdown in terms of our revenues. Mm -hmm. um, of course, the other part of this that is not really directly encapsulated by the budget, but of course, is the increase in costs we've seen. And I think in a lot of the agencies uh, that all of us are a part of are, are seeing that and struggling with that and thinking about ways to address it. Um, I appreciate that you called out the issue with the state sales tax allocation. Um, that is also something that you know we recently looked at at the county board of supervisors, and we'll be writing a letter to our state representatives asking for um, maybe closer to a return to the old way of distributing sales tax. I, I, you know, after all, if you um, we have to build the housing and provide the services for the people who are buying the stuff. Um, and I think ultimately that has a greater need for government services than uh, the robots moving stuff in the warehouses. So um, anyway, with that, is there any uh, public comment on this item? Um, Chair Koenig, yes. I would like to say that there is a movement um, that has been going on for years because this issue has been on the table since the Wayfair decision. And that is that the California League of Cities has, um, they've launched their second study on how it can be more equitably distributed. And the issue is, is that, you know, there's winners and then there's, or there's positive and negative effects on um, any change that's made. And they weren't able to last time come up with a uh, recommendation or, you know, um, something that would be um, accepted. So they're doing it the second time around. It'll be two to three years, um, but we'll follow it closely and we'll get back to you on, on their progress. But it's a very strong movement to make it more equitable because there are a lot of the smaller cities and counties that are being directly impacted by this in an extremely negative way. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. All right, is there anyone in the public that wishes to comment on this item? Seeing no one here in chambers, is there anyone online? We do not have any hands up. All right, then I'll return it to the Commission for Action. I move the staff recommendations. I'll second that. Motion by Commissioner Schifrin, second by, was it Commissioner Montesino? To adopt the staff recommendations. Any further discussion? Okay. All right, seeing none, all those in favor? Budget. Say aye. 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 Are you all right? Any opposed? Any abstentions? That motion passed unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Director Now, We'll now proceed with item 25 which is Santa Cruz County Climate Adaptation Vulnerability Assessment and Priorities Report, Consultant Contract. And for part on this item, we have Transportation Planner, Brianna Goodman. Go ahead. Oh, see, we, do see, we do see the slides, yes. Okay. Or and then the next did. thing I need to see if this works. So, just trying to, um, yeah, I've never seen that. You, you might just need to call out next slide. Okay. It was worth the try. Yeah. Maybe I had. <clears throat> Good morning, commissioners. Brianna Goodman of your staff. I'm before you today to recommend approval of entering into a contract with the firm WSP to assist RTC and the County of Santa Cruz with completing the Santa Cruz County Climate Adaptation Vulnerability Assessment and Priorities Report, or CAVA. Next slide, please. Our community has been through a lot in recent months. I would hazard a guess that after this winter, there will be a lot more interest from the public about this project than there would have been six months ago. Next slide, please. Our community has experienced severe flooding. Slide. 
in some neighborhoods, many times in a matter of weeks. Slide. Transportation agencies have been required to respond quickly to a range of hazards. Slide. Commute patterns have been impacted. Some residents have been trapped and required rescue, and we are grateful to all our first responders. Heavy rain has also resulted in saturated soils, leading to landslides which have impacted transportation infrastructure. But the impacts to transportation go beyond the commute to work. Many rural areas experience being cut off entirely at times. From vital services, access to groceries, children couldn't get home from school. The storms also resulted in storm surge and accelerated coastal erosion, leaving local agencies to ponder next steps and consider constrained resources. Intense rainfall resulted in culvert failures and washouts. They occurred with such frequency the decisions had to be made as to which facilities to prioritize for emergency reconstruction. But as we know, extreme precipitation is not the only hazard to transportation assets that can be accelerated by climate change. This slide shows a concrete freeway buckling from extreme heat. Extreme heat is not kind to asphalt paving either. And as we experience a range of local climate hazards with greater frequency and severity, evacuation routes and their consequences also become a factor in determining priorities. Climate change is happening now here. State and local agencies are pushing back hard with rigorous greenhouse gas reduction targets and strategies, but we also need to come to terms with the reality that even as we work towards these targets, we will still need to adapt our transportation system to this new normal of more extreme weather, sea level rise, temperature extremes, and wildfire risk. Next slide. <laughs> For those of you following along in assistive devices, we've been paging through a series of images of transportation climate hazards as described in the alt text, and we are now on slide 20. In 2019, Caltrans completed a climate adaptation vulnerability assessment for each of its districts and district level adaptation priority reports in 2021. Our CAVA project is funded through a Caltrans Sustainable Communities Planning Grant and proposes to follow and build upon the framework outlined in these reports, first by assessing the vulnerability of all Santa Cruz County maintained transportation infrastructure and the Santa Cruz branch line to climate impacts. Next slide. For the subset of assets exposed, the degree of impacts and timing of impacts will be determined, after which the consequences of these impacts will be determined, and the assets will be prioritized based on the timing and consequences of their impacts, including effects on safety, the economy, and vulnerable communities. Throughout the evaluation process, we will seek robust input from stakeholders and the public with a range of opportunities for participation across key milestones. Working with the County of Santa Cruz, we will integrate findings into a long-range transportation and housing planning, as well as ready projects determined to be high priorities to compete for funding for further analysis and adaptation or hardening design and construction. Along with the Santa Cruz County Departments of Planning and Public Works, RTC will be partnering with the County Office of Response, Recovery and Resilience, or OR3. RTC staff are looking forward to forming a stronger partnership with this important local agency. Contracting with the firm WSP will complete the team. The agency team has already begun exploring opportunities to improve on the Caltrans model, such as adding slope failure to the set of climate hazards to be analyzed. The CAVA will also differ from the Caltrans efforts in that it will include multimodal infrastructure, such as rail and trail on the Santa Cruz branch rail line. Prioritization metrics in particular will need to be unique to Santa Cruz County. We have seen how some groups within our region will face higher consequences from climate hazards, and we must work to prioritize the needs of these vulnerable communities. WSP USA Incorporated is a leader in climate adaptation analysis. The firm developed all of the Caltrans climate adaptation, vulnerability assessments, and priorities reports, and the proposed team members for our project have had extensive experience with the District 5 analysis. This is just a small fraction of their climate adaptation experience. They were the highest ranked firm in both proposal review and interviews. This proposed project schedule has already been modified slightly since I prepared these slides, but it can give the commission a rough idea of timing. Major public outreach will occur this fall, again in spring and fall of 2024, with a final report coming in the beginning of 2025. Thank you. This concludes my presentation, and I welcome your comments. Thank you very much. Other comments or questions from commissioners? Commissioner McPherson. Yeah, I have uh, just a question. Um, climate adaptation vulnerability assessment comma is that the first time that that's come around or is that a new 
Well, whatever. It's a, it's a, it's a brand new um, RTC program, yeah. Okay, all right, we'll get used to it. Okay. Um, my concern is um, when we're looking at this, the climate changes that are coming upon us, uh, I, I'm really concerned about the rail corridor and the impact, and I know I've met, met with some staff about my concerns about this. If in the end, the Coastal Commission in particular, where they're going to allow a rail corridor to go along a ero eroding cliffside in La Selva or Capitol or not. I, I, I'm going to want to need the, uh, I'd sure like to have the answer to that or what their projection is before I really look further into this rail line. I mean, are we going to have to move it a hundred yards inland or I don't know. I just a big concern of mine. And I think of some others too. Yeah, just as a, a clarifying point on that, this this study does not in itself propose um, adaptation designs or strategies. It merely um, uh, prioritizes identified assets. And so, you know, that location you're talking about, supervisor, would obviously, we all know it's going to be pretty high near the top of the list for the rail corridor in terms of um, assets that would require further study and prioritization or further study and, you know, potential hardening or other um, design changes. But this study will not actually propose any of those changes in itself. It will just give you a, a list of what to attack first. Clarifying what COMBA is. Yeah. <clears throat> <laughs> Commissioner Schifrin. Yes, I wanted to respond to Commissioner McPherson's concern, uh, which is definitely a real one. Uh, one thing is to point out to um, that under the Coastal Act, public access to the coast is a critical concern. And the Coastal Commission has been very supportive of rail, uh, rail transportation along the coast. Obviously, there's going to be a problem in areas like some of our areas, um, but I think I would turn now to the executive director because I know that uh, there have been conversations with coastal staff regarding some of the projects that uh, the commission is trying to pursue to maintain the rail line and um, allow it to be maintained. <laughs> So we have been in um, close conversations with the uh, California Coastal Commission. Um, we had some challenges, as you're aware, Commissioner Schifrin, um, with their approval of um, the trail in segment five up by Davenport. Um, we were able to work out a compromise solution that allowed the trail to be built with uh, a minor amount of um, coastal armoring, which is fortifying the coast and and making uh, um, it, it such that it can withstand sea level rise, but it comes at a compromise that over time, we could be losing our beaches and, and the space that we have for our beaches. So we have to kind of um, work with them to, to balance this. Um, uh, part of that approval was based on doing an ongoing study um, of way run up analysis. We're working with them right now on uh, permits for segments um, eight and uh, actually in advance of um, the environmental document coming out for segments 10 and 11 that run along Park Avenue. They want to see a wave run up analysis in that area. Um, we are um, seeing if we can get uh, funding for that. We heard some of the Caltrans planning grants um, um, are still available and, and we're considering applying for funding for that. Um, with regards to the upcoming uh, concept report for electric passenger rail, um, we have it in our scope of services to um, work early and identified several different locations that are subject to sea level rise, including um, uh, the Beach Street area uh, right in front of the boardwalk. Um, I'm sure you're aware of the recent storms had waves crashing up onto uh, Beach Street. Um, uh, Park Avenue, of course, um, just mentioned. Uh, Manresa Beach uh, area is another area. And then Harkin Slough, um, that area actually goes underwater uh, during storm events. Uh, we expect that they're going to ex uh, expect the rail line to be raised in that area. Um, going through that analysis, I think we'll get a good idea as to what is going to be necessary and whether it could be a phased approach over time. 
Um, we'll be uh, working with them on their requested alternatives analysis. Um, they obviously want to minimize the amount of coastal armoring, but I haven't heard um, them say that they wouldn't be uh, willing to work with us on trying to come up uh, with a solution that can be implemented over time. If you um, consider what's been going on down in, in Del Mar, uh, that's where uh, the existing uh, surf liner runs between Los Angeles and um, San Diego. Uh, you'll actually see waves crashing up onto the um, racks. Um, they have required, they have uh, permitted um, uh, retaining walls, which is considered coastal armoring, but they're looking over time that the uh, rail line do be moved in, inland. Uh, this would be similar to a lot of the discussion that's happened with the city of Santa Cruz regarding West Cliff. Um, so we do know that we're going to have to respond and, and that things uh, may need to move, but we don't know exactly when and we'll work with them to come up with strategies so we can um, uh, meet their goals of providing coastal access. And they do um, like the coastal access provided by both rail and trail, but also uh, address their concerns about um, armoring the coast and, and ending up with no beaches over time. So it's a complicated issue. Um, fortunately, we have a good relationship with the Coastal Commission and we'll continue to work with them and provide answers to the commission. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Thank you. Uh, excuse me. Thank you, Chair. Um, what is the uh, total cost of this program, including from Caltrans and from us and everything? Um, well, I didn't bring my laptop up here, but it's um, a little over four hundred thousand dollars for a two-year project. Okay. So um, that includes um, staff time, both the county and RTC. Right. So um, if it were me. I think I might take a little bit different approach. I mean, we have in the past winter and going back to 2020, real world experience in terms of what has happened to our communities, flooding, fires. I mean, even in Scott Valley, we were evacuated for a full week. Um, to me, it seems that instead of going with a third party, that we get together all the entities that participated in, you know, from Caltrans to, to all the emergency procedures, um, getting Caltrans, getting FEMA, CHP, Sheriff, Police, uh, Public Works from all the entities, and maybe have two or three symposiums, uh, different parts of the county inv inviting the public, and share the information. I mean, we just heard about 300 road closures. We talked. We heard about Caltrans wondering if they had to dig a ditch to uh, because there was flooding on Highway One. You know, there's a lot of. To me, if we shared those experiences, school districts. You know, what emergency procedures we would take, and take an afternoon where all these people got together and shared this information directly that could actually talk about how we would most effectively come up with alternative plans to meet these emergencies. Uh, not only would it be, I think, more efficient, but it would certainly be more cost-effective. Um, I'm just worried about when I see slides from this provider that go from 2025 to 2055 to 2085, speculation on how things are gonna be with sea surges, surges and so forth. Um, that's one thing, and maybe they're going to be right. But I think the uh, immediate information that we could gather from all the entities that I just mentioned, from the cities to the to the county to all these entities, would be much more efficient in terms of uh, reaping the knowledge that we need to deal with these emergencies, and and just much more efficient. So. Um, so I guess I'm just looking at maybe from a practical standpoint of, you know, just how, you know, sharing information, okay, directly, immediately, and not waiting for it till 2025 to get some sort of report, uh, but having a real world right now uh, that we can, that, that, that I think serves our county better. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Commissioner Rockin. Um, well, first, I, in an honest and to totally friendly way, may respond a little bit to my colleague um, from Scotts Valley. Um, the idea that putting together a multi-agency meeting to discuss these kinds of questions would be more efficient than having one 
uh, agency that actually does this kind of work and knows what they're doing, it's hard, it's a little it's a it's a hard argument. I think um, I, I'm not against having those meetings. I think the the data that Randy's talking about is important. I would hope that they group doing this work would be, a, of course, consulting with those groups to find out what their actual experiences are. So I don't disagree with this idea about having those meetings. They could be very productive, but the idea that substituting that or stopping this effort of the RTC to actually figure out what our uh, immediate needs are and to be able to prioritize the climate uh, change uh, needs we need to address seems to be not a good idea. Uh, and I also want to just say about the, this is just more specific about the, the uh, rail corridor. The, the people who want to argue that somehow we would be better addressing this issue by not having a train or not or not thinking about looking into and planning for a train, I, I, I re respect the right of uh, all of our members here to reserve their right to totally support this effort until they know, you know, what's it going to cost, what are the consequences is it what's its real feasibility we many, many people have expressed that and i i express my own sense of like you know i'm i'm on board with the train at this point but who knows what the information will get and whether at some point we'll decide it's not a feasible project but the people that are arguing for immediate abandonment that we should like just start building the trail and forget about the train and it's never going to happen first of all in terms of the coastal commission's views not only uh, the comments from our our uh, director, um, but also the comments that uh, the woman from Trail uh, from uh, ec um, Transportation Equity brought up. You know that there's actual the Coastal uh, Commission's views are they support rail uh, transit. I think that's important. But most importantly of all, I'd like to understand what people think the pathway to even a trail without a train is on that corridor without having a train or at least continue to sort of plan for a train, tear up the tracks, the idea of rail banking. I was a supporter of that. I think it was a great idea, but it's, there's no pathway to it. And the end result is you lose the corridor, not just for the train, but for even for a, a, a trail. Uh, because it, the right of way we have there is based on freight, uh, the, the freight uh, planning for freight service to return at some point. Again, whether we do it and whether how that integrates with the passenger service at night, a lot of and huge complexities here and lots of reasons for skepticism. I get that for sure. But this idea of, well, let's just cut and run right now because it's just not feasible. I think that can't do attitude is not helpful for our county. And we do have, in terms of what the public wants, a vote, a very clear vote, the three quarters of the county in every supervisorial district are in support of the idea of at least pursuing the, the train, see what see where it goes, find out what we what the obstacles are, how we can overcome them. And we also have an 11 one vote from this commission that that's the path we're on right now and the idea that we just should abandon it. So I always think about somebody who's tuning in for the first time to hear one of our meetings when they hear from the members of the public, they just go, oh, we need to, you know, get tear up those tracks and just get right to work on the trail. It's not a feasible thing to do. It's less feasible than the train at this point because we'd lose the right, or at least significant portions of the right of way if we went in that direction. So those are my uh, issues about that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Rockin. Um, Other, Commissioner Schiffen? Yes, let me say that as much as I may agree or disagree with Commissioner Rodkin, it's really the rail trail isn't on this agenda item today. So um, I wanted to speak to the comments from Commissioner Johnson because I think he raises a very important point, but I'm not sure it's any different than what is being proposed in this contract, which is really what's before us. Because as I look at the contract, it does have... Um, outreach stakeholder meetings. So, and so I guess I think the point that uh, he raises about getting the various agencies together to talk about their experience, share their experience and start have a starting point of, you know, this is what we've learned. This is what the problems are. Now, this contract is what are we going to do about it? And that that's kind of was my understanding of what this contract was all about. So I did find, I forget, I lost it now, this thing, um, that, there, that as part of the contract, 
tasks are st at least one stakeholder meeting and probably maybe several. And I just wanted to clarify with staff whether the kinds of issues that Commissioner Johnson raised as uh, important to talk about will be uh, incorporated into this contract. The short answer is yes, Commissioner, but um, there will be three uh, opportunities for stakeholder meetings, which will include um, local jurisdictions and response agencies. Our primary partner in this at the county is the Office of Response Recovery and Resilience. They are the ones that have been spearheading all of the efforts in the last few months to um, keep Santa Cruz moving through these storms. So um, we will be uh, attending to a lot of the concerns uh, Commissioner Johnson raised regarding um, getting getting the knowledge from the people on the ground. And also one of the <clears throat> items in the framework would be looking at where do where do these uh, assets already fail under climate hazards a lot already? You know, um, that's going to be one of the factors in using and determining where there are areas of highest risk because we're seeing it happening already. And I would assume that as part of these sta stakeholder meetings that elected officials would be participating as well, um, because oftentimes they have a, a really a comprehensive view of the public impacts of these disasters, uh, while staff has, you know, very important technical understandings. But I think getting the public um, concerns that would be reflected by elected officials this is important. So I hope they would be included in the stakeholder meetings as well. Um, we haven't yet prepared our outreach plan for this project, but I will definitely uh, take your thoughts into consideration. And that's a great idea. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Commissioner Shepard. Other comments or questions? Or, or we'll just add that um, you know, as much as I understand uh, Commissioner Johnson's frustration with a, with another study. Um, you know, I think that as as Commissioner Schiffen mentioned, this will incorporate a lot of the outreach and feedback from the different agencies mentioned. Um, I will also say that in looking at the local coastal program amendment that the county has pursued, um, one of the biggest pieces of feedback from the Coastal Commission when they reviewed that was, hey guys, go get a vulnerability assessment and come back to us with this. And so I think having a vulnerability assessment like this for our transportation infrastructure is going to be a vital step as we uh, look to you know, ultimately secure funding to uh, improve all this transportation infrastructure. So to that extent, I'm supportive of it. Um, I, I just understand what we're going to get here as an end product. So it's not actually going to recommend, it, it'll identify where there's risk and vulnerability, as the title suggests, um, our new acronym, CABA here, um, but it will not actually recommend projects. Is that correct? Um, it will not recommend designs for projects. It will recommend uh, a list of prioritized projects to seek funding for further analysis and um, again, potential uh, climate hardening mm -hmm. uh, or other adaptation. So this is the first step to decide um, where where the areas of highest risk are and what the risk specifically might be to specific kinds of assets and on what timeline. Okay, but yeah, one wouldn't go so far as to you know suggest any engineering or, mm -hmm. or design, right? Okay, um, and then in terms of a priority list, how would it rank that? I mean, is it going to be in terms of daily trips on the facility? I mean, for example, we all talk about the rail corridor a lot. Um, but I was surprised to learn during these recent storms how many people use Bear Creek Road every day. I mean, I think it's in the order of over 10,000, maybe even 15,000 people a day. It's a major artery in the county. Um, but for people traveling from the from San Lorenzo Valley to Silicon Valley, um, I mean, so are we going to look at this in terms of daily active trips as for prioritization, or is there going to be also some factor as, well, you know, there's so many risks to this facility that it'll cost an exponential amount of money to try to maintain it into the future. And so even though it has a lot of trips, we'll, we, you know, we don't recommend prioritizing the project. I mean, how, yeah, can you give any? Um, is any, can you actually page back to the, there's a slide with the list of the um, possible metrics and um, average daily traffic is one of them, but we've got a, a list. Um, that's one of the things that we will be coming up with, with the consultant and the team as the first milestone. Um, we'll be developing the framework and a component of the framework is the consequence metrics and prioritization metrics. So uh, daily use is one of them. Other things would be evacuation routes, transit routes, um, one way in and out. <laughs> Does it have active transportation along it? Um, does it allow access to vulnerable communities or um, key, um, you know, medical facilities or schools? Um, there's going to be a lot of things that go into what what makes that priority list. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, yes, exactly. I just wanted to follow up to a little bit about what you said yourself, um, Chair Koenig, was um, by doing these studies, we put ourselves in position for additional funding. Oftentimes, the big funding grants will be looking to see that we did this first um, before they even determine whether or not you're eligible for, for funding. So that's why we we do these things. And I'm glad we also got clarification on uh, Commissioner Johnson's question. So there is going to be a significant stakeholder um, outreach um, and um, opportunities for input. Those are all very important components. Um, that the state and federal uh, funding agencies that will be providing the big bucks are going to look to see that we already did, that we're not just applying blindly for individual projects. I would um, add to Executive Director's comment um, that we actually use uh, Caltrans Sustainable Planning Grant for this, and then the next cycle of grants, there was a new climate adaptation and vulnerability assessment funding pot for plans just like what we're doing. Um, so I anticipate that this at the very least will be a uh, requirement for future climate adaptation funding um, and that we are ahead of ahead of the game because we're doing it on our own first before um, everybody else in the state. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. So uh, with respect to stakeholders, you know, we heard earlier that in the San Lorenzo Valley, there was a meeting where, where the public attended got to share some of its uh, concerns or what have you. But I, I would also, we, we, awards were given to people who, in my mind, they're kind of the inter intermediaries, but they're, they're the stakeholders of sometimes with the most information. That's, that's kind of my point as well. So engaging them in a meaningful way and maybe even expanding it to schools, you know, they're affected, you know, how, how are they affected and what, what can we do for them? And a variety from the pu public works and so forth. So, uh, I guess we're all on board on the same on the same page here. I just wanted to make sure that those um, uh, people were were engaged with. So, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. All right, if there are no other comments from commissioners, we'll take it out to the public. Anyone here in chambers wish to comment on this item? Seeing none. Is there anyone online? We do not have anybody online. All right, then I'll return it to the commission for action. Move the staff recommendation. Second. Motion from Commissioner Schifrin. Second by Commissioner Rodkin. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And seeing as we do not have a closed session today, that brings us to the conclusion of our meeting. Thank you, everyone. Meeting adjourned. Ready. Ready.